Welcome, everyone. Um, it is April 16th that uh, we are at the Southern Human Services Center. It's our regular business meeting. And my allergies are um, killing me, so my voice doesn't sound like my normal voice, so please um, bear with me if you don't mind. Um, let's see. We have a lot of stuff at our place. Um, we have a sheet for item five. We have a green sheet with the new uh, planning uh, appointments on it. And then um, I, uh, very late, pulled um, 8D to make one change um, under D, the building site. And um, that change is number four. If you get a chance to take a look at that, I'm going to pull that off the consent, but just, th just to get that change in, and I'll talk about that when um, time comes. Um, so um, 5A and 11C you have already. And then we do have a public charge. You all can take a look at that if you don't mind. And um, Ashley, you are our arts moment, and you are going to introduce yourself. So come on up. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. And you do me need tonight. to speak into that microphone so we can get that. OK. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Great. Um, this is kind of embarrassing, but could someone take a picture of me on my phone? <laughs> oh. OK, yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> OK, my name is Ashley Harris. And I am an alum of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I am going to be going to Wake Forest <coughs> for my master's in biomedical sciences. And I am a part of an organization that brings poetry to the Triangle area and also other places in North Carolina called Here and After. I am originally a slam poet, so I've been on the UNC Chapel Hill slam team. I was on the Chapel Hill team for Brave New Voices, which is an international youth competition, and now I just slam for fun. <laughs> so I am going to do a poem dedicated to my grandmother who passed away of cancer a year ago. Um, and she asked me a simple question. She asked, well, my granny's dying wish was to give her mother a gravestone so she wouldn't be remembered as a pile of dirt. If only great granny had been a Confederate soldier, she would have had a gravestone, halls and curriculums dedicated to her. But when is the last time you have seen a black Confederate monument? She wasn't white or man. She would have only served to fertilize the land. The Confederacy fought to keep my people in chains, celebrated to this day. I don't want to hear the Civil War was about the economy, not slavery, when my ancestors were the economy, when we are still the economy. Great Granny would have probably been a medical cadaver found underneath a science building, or used to hold up a table dedicated to enslaved Africans white students eat their lunch on, or used to promote 10% diversity on a banner, or buried in the part of the University of North Carolina graveyard they turned into a parking garage. In the cemetery, she would be stacked above another body, given a brick, for building the campus, while a white slaveholder would be given a thick slab of marble granite with a whole entire story on it. They'd forget to mention her on the UNC Blue and Black tour, say the Tar Heel name is because soldiers muddied their boots, not because their boots were covered in the black skin of my ancestors, but they never forget to mention how General Julian Carr horse-whipped a Negro wench to shreds a hundred feet from here, and him and Grand Dragon, KKK Grand Dragon Saunders, have a gargoyle to remind us to cower on the campus. A building, they always have a building dedicated to history, since history is theirs. There are streets named after this, these racists, while slain black bodies paint them Confederate red. Silent Sam statues serve as scarecrows to scare off and weed out the black students worse than pre-medical classes. And they are afraid we are erasing the Civil War while they erased my family tree like it was written in pencil. 
the same way they refused to rename KKK Saunders Hall to Hurston after one of the very first students of color at the University of North Carolina, Zora Neale Hurston, the same way Florida refused to give Hurston a proper burial. Great Granny and Granny's headstones will be the only Southern monuments I acknowledge. It is proof that they were here when this country tries to write them out of history. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's fabulous. Um, okay, we're going to move on to public comment, and um, this is for matters that are not on the printed agenda. And if you just sign up in the back, uh, you'll have three minutes to speak, and there'll be an opportunity to speak about things that are on the agenda when those um, items come up. And David's bringing that over to me real quickly. Okay, we have got two folks. Uh, Riley uh, Rusky, please, and then uh, C. Miss O'Neill. Three minutes, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. After over $130 million of waste, the light rail project is dead and buried. That's good news. Unfortunately, we still have waste in the public transit system throughout our county. All you have to do is look at these Orange County buses running around empty, spewing taxpayer dollars out of their exhaust pipes. In my experience, the only way to get government waste under control is to cut off the funding. And therefore, I would ask you to, as immediately as possible, to cancel the Article 43 half-cent sales tax so we can cut back this waste. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski. See Ms. O'Neill. Thank you very much. Seamus O'Neill, I live Seamus, in Seamus, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's, that's okay. It's spelled Seamus, but pronounced Seamus. I live in Chapel Hill. I just wanted to pick up on the Linda, Linda Sarsour presentation, picking up from where I commented last, uh, last, at your last meeting. Um, I would contend you consider Linda Sarsour as the radical left's David Duke. This is a, the context here is solving this problem, first res respect and then logic. Um, would you consider David Duke to speak? Of course not, you say. The idea would be absurd. But why? The logic of your actions regarding Sarsour suggests why not have David Duke speak? The views of both are highly offensive and unacceptable to a large portion of Orange County's electorate. What's the problem? Local government has its hands full carrying out its meat and potatoes responsibilities, such as roads, education, public safety, water and sewer, etc., and raising the necessary revenue. Please don't waste your most precious resource, the trust of the electorate, on what I hope was just a bad idea that somehow slipped through the system. If your goal was to tear at the fabric of our society here in Orange County, then you've succeeded. You've used the power of government for one of its most destructive purposes, to divide the people. If this was your goal, I can assure you it will not end well, not for you, not for us, not for our children. On the other hand, if your goal is to unify and inform citizens into a functioning body politic, then agree that the Sarsour incident was a mistake, and don't repeat it, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Would anyone else like to speak? OK, thanks. Let's go on to announcements and petitions, comments Sorry, by board members. I was on the other agenda. I wasn't sure if you were on. Uh, four, you're on 4C. Yes. Okay, we'll bring that up. Do you want to speak beforehand, or are you going to speak about 4C? I was going to speak about 4C. I can do it whenever that Yeah, let's speak when 4C comes up. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Commissioner Dorson, do you want to start us off? Comments? Petitions? Oh. Sorry, I know I caught you off guard there. Oh, no, yeah, that's fine. I forgot that. You're still that's thinking about that poem. Uh, yeah, I am, actually. It's moved. Um, I don't have any... Um, uh, petitions tonight. I did actually. I did want to just make a report, and I actually have some information that I'll be emailing that I've scanned. I attended the North South Bus Rapid Transit meeting on uh, the ninth. Um, that that committee has actually two committees. There's a policy committee and a technical me committee. This was a joint meeting of the two, um, and got an update on the schedule. Um, for, for that, um, the, uh, the timeline is um, that they'll be the, it's a little it's reminiscent of how we were on the light rail. So they'll, in September of this year, there'll be a request to the FDA to have the project evaluated. 
uh, and voted on to get into the uh, president's budget for 21-22. Uh, any rating medium or above is considered good. We should get a rating back on the project by early 2020. Um, they are working to get the uh, design <clears throat> drawings to 30%, at which point it will be turned over to the environmental team for its evaluation. Uh, so they, um, they still have to make some decisions regarding the area from Eubanks Road to uh, North Street as to whether they've resolved that they're either going to construct or convert additional lanes um, and they may not do the same thing all the way down the road um, but they will make that decision by that decision will have to be made by the time it gets submitted to in September um, uh, they expect if everything stays on track you know that there would be uh, two years of construction and a year to order the buses and that if everything proceeded um, that service would begin in 2023 and um, there's still some again there's still some questions outstanding that are going to be resolved over the next six months where where they'll be construct or convert sections of the route they did eliminate a center having the buses travel in the center lane so they'll be on they'll be on the outside lanes um, you know, on the, on the far right. Um, and again, uh, those, all those decisions will be resolved by late summer. There are still also some questions about the, about the route around UNC Hospital since that was that sort of loop around, um, you know, Manning and around behind the parking deck was based on tying it into the light rail stop that was gonna be there. Now, there's not going to be a light rail stop there. There's a question of, does that still make the most sense as far as serving the medical campus and being able to move around in that area? That's it. Mark, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Excuse me, Commissioner Dorson. Um, Mark is fine. Um, so is, is it still true that the bel below, say, Cameron Avenue, there will not be dedicated lanes? They'll just be in traffic? That's right, yeah. Probably from probably from North Street, mm -hmm. you know, which is just north of Rosemary Street uh, till, you know, south of Mason Farm. Yeah, it will be, it will be just in the traffic. So it might or might not arrive at stops on schedule below there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly a reality there. You know, they're going to try to, I don't know what they're going to try to do, but it's, it's re, I mean, I, in my own opinion, is it's going to be a bus rapid transit system from Eubanks to North Street, and then a bus rapid transit system from, you know, 54 to Southern Village. Mm -hmm. And then in between, it's going to be a regular bus. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you. Commissioner Martin. And I'll write all that up and email to you, and also the, the presentation that was yeah, shown. That's great. So I have a draft resolution that I handed out that I hoping we can address at the next meeting. There's a, a resident of Orange County who has been picking up trash everywhere and getting other people to help them and just getting huge amounts of trash uh, out of the creeks and rivers and roads. Daniel Tobin is his name and he really deserves recognition. So that's what this is about. Hopefully we can get on the next agenda. And also, I'd like to petition the Solid Waste Department to figure out a way to communicate to the residents the quickest and easiest way to stop catalogs from arriving in the mail. I personally just got inundated over the last few weeks and just started calling all these catalogs, and it, it takes some time, but there's such, such a huge amount of waste from these catalogs that just show up at your house, you know, 10 steps to the recycling bin and they're gone. Anyway, if, there's a, if we can figure out a way to communicate to folks how to reduce the number of catalogs, we can save money from handling at the recycling stations and save some trees. Commissioner Price? Uh, uh, to, well, I attended the Durham Chapel Hill Carborough MPO meeting and um, as you all know, we did vote to end the, the, the light rail project. And just wanted to say that if you saw the amend, uh, saw the, the resolution, there was one amendment 
to it. Uh, and that was just to mention the role of our um, state government and how that affected the outcome of the project. Um, the, my other um, petition is, is as a result of attending the Family Success Alliance meeting and also this topic also uh, came up uh, during school collaboration, but as summer approaches, we've, we're going to have a lot of children that may or may not have a place to go. And, and also that means they may not get meals. So there's a concern that we, that in the county there may be too few slots for summer camp and, and also um, the cost. There's, a, there's several factors involved. Number one, you know, some of these camp programs are maybe only two weeks long, but you know, kids are out of school for what, maybe six weeks. And uh, the, the cost is pretty prohibitive for some families. And then again, uh, you know, this is where they usually get breakfast and lunch. So I would like uh, us to at least begin to maybe put together a matrix that can go on the website so people have a, um, a place to look to see whether it's through Summer Sizzle with Cooperative Extension or with the school systems, some of their um, summer programs, and to have to, to provide some idea for our residents of wh where their children can go. And then as we go through the year, I mean, we're too close to it, to summer as it is now, but through the year, see where the gaps are and what we might need to do in order to make sure that our children have um, some place to go during the summer. Commissioner Green? Sure. Um, I sent, attended my second TARPO meeting, very interesting, and I uh, want to report that we did pass a resolution to initiate the amendment process to the Orange County CTP to <clears throat> uh, prioritize the project to widen 54 from Carborough West to the county line as, as we voted. Um, so there's that. And I want to say congratulations to Carborough for uh, the dedication they had at presume 5.30 this evening that I wasn't able to get to of the marker uh, 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 recording the history of the name of Carver, but, but repudiating any uh, investment in Julian Carr's uh, positions on race. So I think that's a good thing for Carver. Great, thank you. Um, just two things. I was also at the uh, Durham Chapel Hill Orange MPO, and that was the um, day of the explosion and um, City Hall in Durham, where we all were shook. Uh, and it was pretty scary for, for a couple of minutes. Um, but um, I just want to give a, 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 just a, a big thank you to our first responders. They got to the scene of the accident about a half hour before the explosion and tried to evacuate as, much, as many people as they possibly could, and they did. Um, we did have one person that died, Mr. Lee. <clears throat> um, so our thoughts are with him and his family, and also um, Darren Wheeler, the firefighter that was a little bit too close, um, got hit as well. Um, there were 25 people that were hurt. There was still a couple of people that are in the hospital, but um, it only looks like one other person is sort of touch and go in the burn unit. But otherwise, um, everyone's going to make it, which is just amazing, since that entire structure just uh, blew. Um, it was pretty dramatic. Um, We've been getting a lot of emails about the Green Tract, and um, we're working with uh, Travis and Todd to put out uh, uh, frequently asked questions about the Green Tract. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the Green Tract's been around for 17 years. This is something that's not new. Um, the plans for the Green Tract have pretty much stayed the same for the past 17 years. So um, folks that are saying this is the first time they're hearing of it, well, there's always someone that's going to be the first to hear of something. So. We're going to put that out there so everyone can take a look at that and see what um, some of the plans are, and, and hopefully um, we can work with our municipalities to get moving on that. Um, and that is all I have. Thank you. OK. So <clears throat> we're going to start with um, proclamations, resolutions, and special presentations, and the first one is a proclamation recognizing um, Fred Lewis battle. And Renee, are you going to read that for us? I'm sorry, Commissioner yes. Price? Yes, and Jesse Gibson is here to receive this, so if you want to come He's forward. He's signed up to speak after yeah. you read it. Yeah, okay. Orange County Board of Commissioners, proclamation recognizing Frederick Lewis battle. Whereas Frederick Fred Lewis battle was a leader in Orange County and throughout his life 
worked tirelessly to improve the quality of life for the people of Orange County and beyond. And whereas our entire community mourns the passing of Fred Battle on April 1st, 2019, and expresses our sincere sympathy to his family and friends. And whereas over the course of his lifetime, Fred Battle fought for justice and social equality, starting as early as the 1960s with a history-making protest against Woolworths in Greensboro, North Carolina, pushing forward the na nationwide civil rights movement. And whereas, as local activists, Fred Battle and Yanni Chapman co-founded the Orange County Rainbow Coalition of Conscious in 1982, and whereas, continuing the fight for social justice, Fred Battle founded the Chapel Hill Carborough branch of the, North, of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1987 and served as its president for over 20 years. And whereas Fred Battle freely, gave freely of his time, energy, and talents in serving the community, and whereas he helped to improve the way of life for area residents by serving on the Orange County Board of Health, the Orange, County, the, the Orange Water and Sewer Authority Board of Directors, the Solid Waste Advisory Board, <coughs> the Joint Orange Chatham Community Action Board, the Intergovern Intergovernmental Parks Work Group, and the Chapel Hill Carborough Schools Board of Education. And whereas in the 2015 Salute to Community Heroes, the Chapel Hill Carborough Chamber of Commerce recognized Fred Battle with the Irene Brigham and Lifetime Achievement Award. And whereas Fred Battle fought the fight to move forward the human rights of all people for equality and social justice, in his words, the struggle continues. Now, therefore, we, the Orange County Board of Commissioners, on behalf of the residents of Orange County, express our deep appreciation, gratitude, and respect for the services rendered by Frederick Lewis Battle to the county and beyond over the course of his lifetime. This, the 16th day of April, 2019. Thank you, Commissioner Price. And I move this proclamation. Second. Moved and second. Mr. Gibson, would you like to speak? Uh, Thank you for joining us. Come on up to the... Oh, I'm not ashamed. Yeah, you can speak. Come on. I just ditto all that you said, and I don't have that much to add to it, except Fred did enter the uh, Lincoln High School Hall of Fame, and we are changing the name from Yanni Chapman, Bill Thorpe, uh, Hank Anderson. Oh, no. To add Frank, uh, Fred's name uh, to the uh, Breakfast Club. And I really sincerely thank you for the recognition that you're giving, in addition to what the city of Carver, as well as the city of Chapel Hill, has done in adopting similar resolutions. So I just want to say thank to you, thank you, thank you. And that's it. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. Why don't you stay right there? All those in favor of passing the resolution, say aye. 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 Against? OK, it passes unanimously. Thank you. And would you mind giving this to the family for us? Yes, I will. That would be great. Huh? You didn't get that photo. That was too quick. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's move on to um, 4B, County Government Month, and Commissioner Dorson, would you mind reading that for us? Uh, okay, um, Orange County Board of Commissioners Proclamation, County Government Month, <coughs> Connecting the Unconnected. Whereas Orange County is one of 3,069 counties in the nation that provide cost-effective essential services to create healthy, safe, and vibrant communities, and Whereas, through National Association of Counties President Greg Cox's Connecting the Unconnected initiative, NACO is demonstrating how counties deliver people-centered services to residents. And whereas many Orange County departments offer programs and services that meet this initiative, including the Departments of Health, Housing and Community Development, Criminal Justice Resources, Social Services, Aging, Sheriff's Office, Child Support Services, and many more, and Whereas Orange County's motto is, our residents come first. 
which guides our employees to treat all residents with fairness, respect, and understanding. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Orange County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim April 2019 as County Government Month and express our appreciation to the county employees who make our community such a special place to live, work, and raise a family. This is the 16th day of April 2019. So moved. Second. Second, Todd, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, just thank you for doing that, and we're continuing to try to promote all of the great things that the county does uh, throughout the month of April on social media. So if y'all see tweets and Facebook posts that come out, if you could just help us amplify that, that'd be great. Great. Thank you so much. We've got a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Okay. I just want to comment that I think the fact that it's National Government Month and National Poetry Month is not a coincidence. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty funny. Um, okay, we're going to move on to uh, 4C, and what we'll do is we'll read the resolution first. We have three people signed up. So let's read the resolution, then we'll, have, we'll hear from the public, and then we can comment on this. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, mention that the five of us were at the um, 110th anniversary of the NAACP. Uh, some of us had conversations with Damon, who, uh, Damon Siles, who uh, uh, penned the resolution for Carborough. Uh, we took that resolution and, and brought that into... Uh, at Orange County, uh, making sure that the county uh, adds to it what the county's doing. Uh, in the in the meantime, uh, we've had we had some anti-Semitic action happen on campus, um, so we felt that um, I, I sent emails around and felt that it was important to make sure that we call that all out um, as well. Um, we we can we use resolutions as a tool for our voice, uh, and it's in it's important to to call out hatred every time. It happens. It just can't be the new normal. Um, so, Commissioner Green, do you want to read that for us? And, oh. Yeah. Whereas Orange County is home to many students, employees, and alumni of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, including an estimated 29,000 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, and the life of the southeastern portion of our, our county is intertwined with the life of the university, and whereas on March the 31st, 2019, two persons desecrated the Unsung Founders Memorial in McCorkle Place on the UNC Chapel Hill campus by defacing it with racist graffiti and with urine and someone vandalized an installation outside Haynes Art Center with racist language. And whereas on March 16th, 2019, persons associated with a white supremacist group carried firearms and other weapons onto the UNC Chapel Hill campus in violation of the North Carolina general statutes and campus policy, and an alert Carolina emergency notification was not issued, and no arrests were made, and no citations or trespass notices were issued. And whereas on April 10th, 2019, a statement was released by UNC Hillel that a number of anti-Semitic flyers had been found in Davis Library with reference to, quote, an evil Jewish plot in the missive, and the missive, do everything you can to fight the silent, covert Jewish attempt to enslave and kill good Americans. And whereas student anti-racist activists have been prohibited infinitely, indefinitely from entering certain areas of the campus, including McCorkle Place, despite having been found not guilty of the criminal charges related to their trespass notices, or having had those charges dismissed. And whereas the Chapel Hill Carver branch of the in National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, the Carolina Black Caucus, and others have called upon UNC Chapel Hill to take bolder action in response to acts of racial and ethnic intimidation and threats by white supremacists to the safety of the community, and whereas the Orange County Board of Commissioners appreciates Interim Chancellor Kevin Guskowicz's statement that, quote, we must nurture an environment where all people in our community can live, learn, and work without fear. And the board is encouraged by the arrest on April 8th of the persons believed to have desecrated the Unsung Founders Memorial. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners urges its neighbor and partner, UNC Chapel Hill, to rescind trespass warnings against student and ranty racist activists, to press charges and issue trespass warnings against persons who on March 16th carried firearms onto the campus, 
to clarify when the community may expect the presence of an armed person on or near the campus to trigger an Alert Carolina emergency notification and to invite community members not necessarily affiliated with the university to participate in the Campus Safety Commission being convened by the interim trans chancellor. Be it further resolved that the county wishes to partner with UNC Chapel Hill in a shared commitment to helping students feel safe through better communications, education about the Orange County Sheriff's Office and other law enforcement agencies, opportunities to participate in county programming and advisory committees, continuing continued participation in the Good Neighbor Initiative and other efforts. Be it further resolved that the board ask the clerk of the board to share this resolution with the interim chancellor of UNC Chapel Hill and the members of the Chapel Hill Town Council, the Hillsborough Board of Commissioners, and the Carver Board of Aldermen. This the 16th day of April, 2019. So moved. Second. Uh, moved and a second by Price. Um, and now we will have discussion. Did you want to talk? Yeah, I just want to say that um, this actually originated the day before on Saturday at the NAACP meeting. And um, the Anna Richards had expressed that, you know, this happened at UNC. And we, and I feel that um, even though it was at Chapel Hill and Carborough, it affects the entire county, all of us. And for that reason, I, I am totally in support of this resolution because I think it, I know we've got this one orange campaign going on, but I, I think it's important that we all work together to ensure the safety of our community. So I presume we're going to send this resolution to UNC. Are, are we also going to send a letter actually requesting an answer to our request to rescind the trespass warnings against student anti-racist activists and to issue trespass warnings against the persons who carried firearms. We could do that. Something that specifically requests that they respond to us, not just read a resolution and understand our, our mm -hmm. sentiments. We could do that. Thanks. Okay, let's hear from the public. Uh, Mr. Riley Rusky, uh, followed by Seamus O'Neill, followed by Jamie Pollan. Three minutes. Again, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I am a strong believer in the rule of law. I'm a veteran. I took an oath to defend this country and defend the Constitution and laws of this country. This resolution is an example of blatant hypocrisy and bias of Orange County government and the county commissioners. Not long ago, when mobs and thugs were harassing and intimidating citizens of Orange County and damaging property on the UNC campus, government officials and the commissioners supported and condoned those illegal actions. When the thugs and mob finally destroyed the historical monument known as Silent Sam, the commissioners actually posted an announcement of approval of the result of those mob and thug actions. Now that some other thugs and vandals are harassing and intimidating other individuals and vandalizing other property on the UNC campus, county government officials and the commissioners proposed to pass a resolution condemning such actions and calling for charges and prosecution of those responsible. I agree with that. But one of the founding principles of this nation was equal justice under the law. This resolution demonstrates the bias, inequality, and inequity of Orange County officials in regard to this principle. Why allow one group of mobs and thugs to act illegally with no consequence, but demand application of laws to another group of thugs and vandals? This resolution and previous actions of the commissioners show bias and a disregard for the full and equal application of the laws of our nation and state. I urge all county officials to advocate for and restore the principle of equal justice under the law for all members of our community when laws are broken, regardless of the ideology or motives of the lawbreakers. If you must pass this resolution, modify it to condemn the actions of all thugs and mobs that break the laws, regardless of their ideology. I would ask why no such resolution was passed when the mobs and thugs broke the laws during the Silent Sam protests and why you are asking for those lawbreakers to be relieved of the modest punishment of being prohibited from a corkle place. To advocate for actions which break the law but support a political or ideological agenda demonstrates hypocrisy, prejudice, and blatant disregard of the rule of law and justice. Thank you, Mr. Ruski. Seamus O'Neill, three minutes, sir. Uh, David wants to take it. Seamus, <coughs> Seamus O'Neill, I live in Chapel second, Hill. Second. 
Sorry. Is, it, is this supposed to be on? One of these? Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, into the resolution 4C, uh, I'd like to suggest the insertion of two whereases, which I think will help round out this resolution. After the first whereas, I'm suggesting you include the following. Uh, whereas on August 20th, 2018, a mob of certain students, faculty, and persons known and unknown tore down the silent sta Sam statute uh, at risk to themselves, police officers, and others in violation of state and UNC rules, state law and UNC rules. And then after the third whereas, which is currently, uh, as, this for, as this resolution is currently formatted, please insert, whereas on March 22nd to 24th, Duke UNC sponsored the Conference on Ga Gaza, many parts of which degenerated into an anti-Semitic rant and mockery. Uh, the second one is important because it pl may play a role in the where whereas that follows, the fourth whereas. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Ms. Pollan. We're having a little trouble with our timer. But you know what three minutes looks like. Yeah. Approximately. I don't think I'll be talking that long. Um, I think most of you know me. I'm Jamie Pollan. I'm a local attorney. Um, I don't know how many of you know that I was a magistrate here in Orange County for two years. And um, during that time, I spent a good bit of time overnight in the Chapel Hill uh, magistrate's office. I knew police officers' names and their children's names and where they went to school and had great relationships with them. And I left the magistrate's office and um, became involved in anti-racist work. Um, I think people might identify me as Antifa, although I'm just a Hillsborough resident that you know believes in justice. And um, I've, I've had the opportunity to work with several anti-racist groups. And through that work, um, I was present at two events at UNC. I was not present the night that Silent Sam came down, but I was present the night that um, the smoke bombs went off and present the night of the um, dance party slash can party, which that all may be at the same night. I kind of can't keep the two events separated, but um, I was shocked. I mean, really shocked that police officers that I had seen um, uh, be responsible for arresting and justice in this county were um, basically attacking students. And I think some of that has borne out through the criminal proceedings that have occurred in the interim. There's an appeal, well, it's not exactly an appeal, a request for reconsideration for one of the uh, young people that was um, uh, convicted because the evidence has shown that actually she wasn't it wasn't possible that she did what she was actually convicted of doing. Um, all of this is to say that I kind of come to this work from a different perspective than many people. I don't have an anti-police bias. I would never be at an event yelling, uh, cursing at the police. Um, I respect greatly what they do, um, all law enforcement. However, um, what I've seen, again, was really shocking. Um, I was with Maya Little in the magistrate's office when she was served with the notice of trespass by a police officer that had made several accusations against her, you know, all of which, well, in that second, all of which were um, eventually borne out to not have been true. So um, I'm so grateful to you for um, making this proclamation and you know holding the university accountable for example there's video evidence of a unc police officer telling the people who were carrying those firearms on them that they were on campus i'm telling you as a magistrate that there is nothing to prevent unc police from going to the magistrate's office today and taking out an arrest warrant um, against the people who were unlawfully carrying firearms on campus. That's a felony. And, um, you know, I don't know Maya 
very well. I've, I've met her on a few occasions, as well as Lindsay. Um, I think you all know that um, I'm good friends with Heather Redding, De uh, Devin Seardis, Altha Cravey, uh, Ivy Barger, all of whom have, have unfortunately, because they were in Chatham County last night, were unable to make it tonight. But they all support this resolution as well. And um, really the goal is to keep the students who are exercising their lawful First Amendment rights to speak out against injustice, whether that be the university or police, that's what they're doing and the police need to be protecting them. So I appreciate your willingness to hold them accountable and um, as far as Commissioner Markopoulos' suggestion to actually have some response from the university, I support that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, would anyone else like to speak? Ms. Harris? <laughs> you look like you want to speak. You good? Come on up. You got three minutes. Please join us. Um, I didn't prepare anything unlike everyone else, but when I was going to UNC, I was a part of the Silent Sam Coalition. And I just wanna say it's very interesting that people can equate um, the act of practicing hate speech um, and hate crime to people of color uh, students of color addressing that something that has been historically racist and historically against them makes them uncomfortable. That doesn't equate to me at all. And I would like students of color and people of color who live in this county to feel comfortable. And I don't see a problem with what you guys have addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harris. I appreciate it. I hope I didn't put you on the spot, but I saw the words coming out. So. Okay, so we have a first and second on this. Any comments? Yeah, I, I just want to echo the last speaker's point. I mean, I think the idea that um, somehow our previous resolution and this resolution are inconsistent um, is just, I, I, you know, just doesn't make any sense to me at all. The, con the, the we have been consistent in our opposition to racism and to um, in racial intimidation and white supremacy. And I think, you know, exactly what we're calling for is the full and equal application of the laws. And what we know is that the student protesters were treated one way and that the uh, white supremacists on campus were treated another way. And so um, I, I think that, uh, that this board has been consistent in its commitment uh, to anti-racism. And I hope that we um, continue to do that and continue to speak out. I know I just someone said there was a, a meeting of the Chatham County commissioners. Uh, you know, spent a couple of hours listening to comment last night. It was a very compelling meeting. If you have, didn't get a chance to see it, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that they're going to take action to address this in their community. Um, and this is a this is a issue that is conf you know we're confronting it here at a microcosm, but it's taking place all across the nation. And so, I think it's critical that we continue to speak out uh, the way we have. Commissioner Price? And I would like to echo what Commissioner Markopoulos said, um, that we should demand some, or at least request some kind of action. Uh, at the NAACP meeting that Saturday, um, you know, there was discussion about jurisdiction and people, uh, some people expressing reservation because of jurisdiction. But I do think that because this is, even though it is state property, that it is in our community and we should, at least request some kind of action. Uh, um, the NAACP did meet with the, um, the interim chancellor, and so the talks continue, but I think we should actually do more than just pass a resolution. Uh, so just to follow up on that, um, Commissioner Mark Hopless and I met with um, the Director of Communications about two months ago, and we said that we're gonna have, have ongoing conversations um, at least once a month. So I have had those ongoing conversations with those folks as well. Uh, mentioned this, mentioned the committee that they're um, forming, and we talked a little bit about that and who's going to be on that committee. Um, I also asked them to um, send us updates and information as they're working on this process. Um, we also know that um, Kristen Smith is going to be, Kristen Smith Young, I'm sorry, is going to be the new um, uh, community relations person, and she will be more of a contact for us also to get that information. Um, she begins her new position 
on April 23rd. So we, we'll have that um, connection, but I will continue to meet with UNC on a monthly basis um, and have these conversations and continue all kinds of conversations with them. Um, so with that, um, we have a motion and a second to um, pass the resolution as printed. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? And that passes unanimously. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you for speaking, everyone. Okay, we're going to um, go to 5A, which is Unified Development Ordinance, UDO uh, Table of Permitted Uses. Um, and this is a public hearing to receive planning board recommendations, take action on the planning board director's initiative, Unified Development Ordinance, UDO text amendments to the tables of permitted land uses and other sections needed. Um, Michael Harvey will help us with those um, sections. There was a lot to digest, and um, there were some meetings, individual meetings with Mr. Harvey and board members. So hopefully every question that had to be asked was asked. But you know how that goes. One can hope. <laughs> Michael Harvey, Orange County Current Planning. I'm here to present the UDO text amendment dealing with the table of permitted uses. Uh, you have a, as the chair has already pointed out, a fairly voluminous packet. Uh, attachment one is the actual public hearing legal ad. <coughs> attachment two, which begins on page seven, is a document with staff prepared to identify and provide a summary of all the recommended changes to aid you in your review. Attachment three is a project fact sheet and frequently asked questions that came up during the two-year process. The table of permitted uses was modified. Attachment four, which you'll find on page 53, is a memorandum prepared by the staff attorney uh, for review by the planning board dealing with the burden of persuasion language. Attachment five are excerpt draft minutes from the March 3rd and March 20th planning board meetings and their signed statement of consistency. That's on page 57. Uh, attachment six is the statement of consistency that we as the staff and management are recommending you hopefully take action on this evening. And last but certainly not least, beginning uh, on page 83, uh, attachment seven is the actual UDO amendment package. So without further ado, a little background. Current regulations, the current unified development ordinance actually contains three different separate tables of permitted uses, outlining what is permitted for development within Orange County. Specifically, there's a table governing development in what I will call the general use zoning districts. That includes the rural buffer, the rural residential, general commercial, neighborhood commercial zoning districts. We have a separate independent table governing development within one of our nine economic development districts in the Buckhorn, Hillsboro, and Eno areas. And last but certainly not least, we have a independent table governing development within the conditional zoning districts. That's the master plan development or MPD, the home park, or the RITA rural economic development area conditional zone districts. As you will note from my abstract, these tables contain unique, distinct, and in many instances contradictory lists of allowable land uses. Uh, the one example I've constantly used with you is that we can find eight or nine different ways to say retail in three tables of permitted uses. So why are we doing this? In 2015, the state Supreme Court in Byrd versus Franklin addressed an issue concerning tables of permitted uses and how uses are identified. And in that finding, they found that the mere omission of a listing of a land use within a table does not mean it's prohibited. The standard utilized by most, most local planning departments throughout the state is that when you don't list a land use, such as a nuclear power plant, that means that that use is not permitted for development within the district. Well, with the bird finding, uh, that is no longer the case. In fact, what the bird finding did is that the onus is placed on local governments for us to spell out what uses are allowed and what uses are prohibited in order for the layman to be able to ascertain what he or she can do with their property. This court proceeding also hit the point home that the law does favor the unhindered free use of private property over government restrictions. The result is that we have work to do, and that work is to create and fashion a table that properly identifies what will and will not be permitted for development within Orange County. This project started in January of 2017. Our Planning Board Ordinance Review Committee uh, has met on this 10 separate times, 10 different meetings to review the proposed changes. 
you all will recall in August of 2017, we had a work session with staff, board members, and the county attorney's office to review the direction of the project and change how the methodology upon which staff was going to be utilizing to finalize the, the list. There were four open house meetings to solicit public input that occurred in July of 2017 and August of 2018. Whoops, my apologies. So what does this amendment do? Well, collapses three tables into one. That ought to be enough. Uh, we no longer have to review three different sections of the Unified Development Ordinance to try to ascertain what is and is not permitted. Uh, based on comments received in August of 2017 from the elected officials and direction from the county attorney's office, we collapsed similar land uses into single-use categories to avoid an exhaustive list and to provide as much flexibility uh, to local property owners with respect to how they can develop their property. The examples I use, and as I've already articulated, retail is now a single land use versus six to ten sep listed separate activities. Uh, overnight accommodation, which used to uh, be 10 to 12 separate land uses, is now three new categories. Can I, can I ask you just a quick question, just for, for, in this framing context? So I just want to understand, just using those examples, so, is it fair to say that what we're doing or what you've tried to do is, um, is simplify the UDO? In other words, when we went from six to 10 separate retail um, As we a single, have. to a single one, mm -hmm. Did we actually, were there actually definitions that are now prohibited? In other words, have we made substantive changes where we said, you know, there were 10 things and we decided five of them are no longer allowed at all and the other five we condensed into one? Or what we have done is realize that it was unnecessary to have 10, we could have this overarching definition that includes all. That's one question. Okay. So I, you, and then I have an, another one after that. All right, but the, you, the honest answer is both. In many instances, we didn't need an exhaustive list. We condensed them into one single land use category like retail. Uh, so rather than saying retail eight to 10 different ways, we now just say it in one way, retail. We have added definitions to provide additional framework with respect to what we consider land uses to be, thereby providing additional direction, not only for the staff to utilize, but to assist local property owners to determine what they can do. This effort is a streamlining attempt of the Unified Development Ordinance. It's an attempt to make it more user-friendly and easily easier to understand. What this ordinance also does is collapse, condense existing land uses while maintaining existent policy. And that's the example for the overnight accommodation. Uh, currently, uh, if you- Let me just ask you a follow-up question. Okay. Um, so just to, just to make sure I'm understanding right, it, it was, is there some use that was prohibited under the old 10 definitions of retail? Mm -hmm. Some type of business that person X could have been, could have, found a zoning place to have that is no longer permitted anywhere? No, sir. Not from that example perspective. Okay. Yeah. That's now, helpful. Now, with respect to the, the next example, the question you asked, obviously we have multitudes of different ways in the Unified Development Ordinance to say what I call in this context overnight accommodation. Uh, hotel, motel, motor lodge, motor inn, inn, tourist inn, hotel residential, um, rooming house, rural guest establishment, which is further broken down into bed and breakfast, bed and breakfast inn, country inn, and the litany goes on. You don't need to say it 12 different times. Right. What we've proposed and what we've done in this specific example is condensed everything into short-term rentals, three land use categories. But my point, and I think this is the point you're wishing that I hit home, is that the policy initiatives that form the backdrop to these regulatory standards is maintained in this ordinance in these changes. So the example I'll give you is with short-term rental as the prime example, we have a requirement in the current code where you have short-term rental situations in residential zoning districts, you have to have a host on site. The property owner has to be on site. That policy is maintained in the revised UDL. 
we don't allow non-host occupied short-term rentals in the residential zoning districts. And again, that's rural buffer, agricultural residential, rural residential. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, there's probably more questions about that item, you know, that we'll get to later on. But I, I think that, yeah, that does answer my question. And, and, um, and then I, I just want to be clear on the, on the start of this and the case, and maybe this is a question for our consigliere. The, the, the way it, we used to have it was mm -hmm. it was a list of everything you could do. Is that right? That's what the, and, and our, our operating presumption and the law's operating presumption, I guess, before Bird was, and anything that wasn't listed was prohibited. Right. And then the case says, no, anything, anything that's not prohibited is allowed. That's essentially right. It, you know, the, the case says um, land use is a fundamental right. You, know, you have a fundamental right to use your property however you want. And any regulation that is in derogation of rent land use must be clear and, and must be um, interpretable uh, as to what it is prohibiting. Uh, so any, any reliance on something that says, you're allowed to do this, and conceivably you're not allowed to do other things. It, it will no longer be uh, interpreted in favor of the county. So. And and it would I presume the court wouldn't have accepted just saying here's the five things are, that are permitted, and anything that's not listed here is expressly prohibited. That's correct. Correct. Right. That can't be done. Right. Okay. That's that's, that's kind of how we have been operating, and, and bluntly, that's how every local government's been operating for decades. So this is a fundamental correction. And, and as you said, it's a fundamental correction that every local government, unless they were already doing it by prohibited use, is also having to do what we're having to do. Correct. They, they should be. Um, but it's not something unique to Orange County is what I mean. That's correct. Thank you. All right, what this amendment also continues to do is it modifies Article 5, the land uses provision, incorporating development standards. Uh, uh, this is taking existing language and moving it from various provisions of the UDO and placing it in Article 5. For example, we have language establishing that certain land uses are not permitted through the conditional zoning process. Uh, we are now placing that with each individual land use. Uh, that was to ensure legal sufficiency. We are also modifying existing language to clarify setbacks, land use buffers, and also to ensure consistency by establishing submittal requirement standards of evaluation, which when you read the current Article 5 is said three different ways. We're just going to have one unique way to say it, standards of evaluation, uh, submittal requirements. We modified Article 10 definitions, which incorporated a lot of new and revised definitions uh, to ensure that we were being legally sufficient and consistent with the direction of the table permitted use amendments. And we incorporated modifications to the economic development uh, Hillsborough districts as directed by the BOCC in late 2016, early 2017. What this amendment does not do, this amendment does not alter existing development restrictions with respect to setbacks, minimum lot sizes, required land use buffers. Uh, it does not impact or alter the county's watershed management program, specifically dealing with impervious surface limits, density limitations, uh, nor does it alter required application submittal and review criteria. For example, if under the current code, the your proposed land use was required to be reviewed and acted upon through a class A special use permit process, it's still required to go through a class A special use permit process. We didn't alter that. Planning Board recommendation. Again, as I articulated, the Ordinance Review Committee for the Planning Board uh, reviewed this at 10 separate meetings over the last two years. Uh, they held two meetings on March the 6th and March the 20th to review this item. They voted seven to one to recommend approval of amendments uh, as presented to you this evening, but further recommended that the Board of County Commissioners eliminate proposed language uh, establishing a burden of persuasion for those applying for variance, interpretation, or special use permit applications. The planning director has recommended that you approve uh, attachment six, the statement of consistency as presented, and you approve the UDO amendment and it contained in attachment seven in its entirety, keeping the burden of persuasion language uh, as recommended by the director and the county attorney. 
Uh, as indicated in the abstract, the director believes the language is necessary uh, to ensure the legal sufficiency of the Unified Development Ordinance by spelling out an applicant's obligations when applying for a variance interpretation and where a special use permit. Any questions? Commissioner Price? Uh, are you, so is this, you're done with your presentation or is there more? Well, the manager's recommendation is that you approve okay. attachment six, the statement of consistency after holding the public hearing, accepting public comments, closing same, and then approving attachment seven as presented by staff, keeping the burden of persuasion language intact. Okay. So I have a question, which I'll try not to turn into a comment, uh, about your prohibition of pawn shops and payday loans. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not in so much, I'm not trying to support them. Yeah. And I know that they're non-existent right now, but um, some people, unfortunately, <clears throat> need those services, you know, pawn shop. And I'm wondering if we actually have the legal authority to prohibit them. Uh, we do have the legal authority to say they're not permitted in this in, in the county's jurisdiction. Uh, that's one of the opportunities we have in terms of defining the use and saying that it's not permitted within the district. I will remind the board that that prohibition comes from meetings that occurred in 2017 with several board members and we maintained it. Commissioner Markopoulos and I have had long discussions about that very, uh, that very issue and I'm going to let him speak to some of his comments uh, in a moment that I think will also address some of your concerns. Well, I also know that um, one of the uh, pawn shop companies has been very supportive of our public schools. Mm -hmm. And they've given um, cash donations as well as instruments so that people could, so that middle school students could at least have an instrument to play. Mm -hmm. And so it was just pushing, you know, the arts. So I, and in addition to that, I am concerned about people that unfortunately may have to use pawn shops in order to, to survive. Did you want to add anything to that? Well, I just think we ought to figure out a way to allow pawn shops. It's a, it's a, it's a great source of musical instruments, for one thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think it, it, they can work if they're, if they're regulated properly, and you know, it's usually when they venture into the illegal activity that, that it's a problem and we just keep an eye on that but I, I, I don't see why in the in the right sort of in town environment mm -hmm. they, they couldn't work well if it's in town it's not in the county I mean it, it, you know if it's in one of the towns you, you don't have any control over that anyway same with the other thing mm -hmm. do the towns have porn shops now I honestly don't know the answer to that question since I don't regulate them I, I right. don't I know I, I don't. I choose not to learn their ordinances by rote. <laughs> I'm just not recalling it. I know Durham does. I'm just not recalling. Seeing I haven't it. seen any around no. here at all. I mean, are there any businesses that would be forced to close by this provision? No, sir. Other questions before we open up the public hearing? Yeah. So um, one of the things that we discussed when you when we met and you gave me a review of this was. Um, I, I think that we should allow, we should find a way to allow businesses that provide products or services that we use, even though we might think there are challenges in some ways for allowing them to be here. For instance, we don't allow asphalt plants right now, right? So. The, the, the proposal does not allow asphalt plants. That's a correct statement. And that also goes, again, to addressing previous comments from past commissioners. So we, you know, we, we use asphalt. Uh, it, it strikes me as uh, hypocritical for us to say we're going to utilize asphalt, but we're not going to let it be uh, manufactured where we live, right? It's the same thing comes up with meat processing facilities. You know, um, a lot of... Um, I know I, you, can, you can have a, a small meat processing facility as part of your farm, but I know a lot of farms go to a, a meat processor in, it's in Burlington or Graham. Um, but I, I think we should, that's another example of uses that we should allow and figure out the right uh, ways to control them so that the ill effects don't uh, 
hurt, you know, hurt the environment or anybody else, but I think we have sort of a moral obligation to allow businesses whose products and services we use to be in Orange County. Commissioner Green? Yeah, to follow up on that, we, we had that discussion, you, you and I, with, with uh, Michael, and, um, and I agree with that about the, the, the butcheries at any rate. And, uh, but I'm, I'm recalling, Michael, that you had a response to that. And I don't, I'd like to remember what it was about the butcheries that... The, the response was is that we have, under the agricultural uses land use category on page 118, agricultural processing facility allowances throughout the county, well, allowed in the county. Also, as Commissioner Markopoulos has just pointed out, this does not have an impact on farming operations who obviously are allowed to process their own, uh, process their own meat. From the manufacturing standpoint, what Commissioner Markopoulos and Commissioner Green are referring to is actually in the manufacturing, uh, assembly and processing of food, and forgive me as I get to that provision, and I'm on page 121 uh, of the packet, um, there are allowances in the current or in the proposed text <coughs> for animal feed preparation, manufacturing, packaging, and distribution. What we had left out was the animal slaughtering operation. And, and I understand that where Commissioner Markopoulos is coming from, our position at the time, and, and still quite candidly sit, standing before you, I'm not going to change my mind or at least I'm not going to change my story to you, is that there was a concern about allowing these in our economic development districts uh, where they might impact or have a negative impact on adjacent uh, commercial operations or could be a, a detraction from locating in an economic development district. And I think that's where Commissioner Cropless has suggested, and I know he's going to bring up a couple of points tonight, that it may be time to look and see whether or not they could be done in industrial districts versus the economic development districts. Right. But going back to in the agricultural use districts, it, you read the text, but if that included um, slaughtering livestock, would that, um, would that be just for that property's own use, or would they be able to market that service to other people? The agricultural processing facility land use would actually be able to market it uh, to non-farmers. It, it, they're allowed in right now in industrial districts as an example. So right now we have that, but not for animals. Correct. Thanks. So why don't we open up the public hearing, and then we can come back to questions and comments. And do we have, no one is signed up for this. OK. Um, let's close the public hearing. So I need a motion to close the hearing. I need to close the public hearing. Do you ever have a motion to open the public hearing? Oh. <laughs> yeah. I moved to open the I public hearing. I just opened it. <laughs> okay. All right. Open it by uh, Green. Second. Second by Dorson. Close. We have to vote on that. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, my Zyrtec kicked in. Um. <laughs> motion to close. Mm -hmm. Motion to close. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So let's ask some more questions, and then we can make some comments and add additional. Um, so I just wanted to go back to the, <coughs> if it's OK with everybody, the planning board voted 7 to 1 um, about the burden of persuasion. And I just don't want to ignore the fact that the planning board worked on this. Um, and and I, I, if you read the minutes, they had some pretty um, hearty discussions. Um, so. Um, maybe, John, you can explain to us why you think that needs to be in there and, you know, how this conversation went. I, you were not at the planning board meeting, so Michael can kick in when he needs to. Uh, so the, the burden of persuasion issue is uh, trying to make this clearer in what is, re in, in what is required. Uh, when you have the, when you go into a quasi-judicial hearing, the applicant has a burden of proving by clear, competent material substantial evidence that they have met all the requirements in the ordinance and are entitled to their um, permit, their variance, whatever it may be. Um, part of that requirement, part of that burden of proof is that you persuade the fact finder <coughs> that you have presented sufficient evidence that you have <coughs> met your 
uh, burden in um, showing that you're, you've complied with all of these requirements. And, and courts do look at the burden of persuasion. Um, similarly, the opponent, uh, whoever the opponent is for an applicant, for a permit, for a variance, uh, something of that nature, they have a burden of persuading the fact finder that the applicant has not met their burden of proof. Uh, they need to present evidence that says, okay, um, this, this is why they have not complied with uh, the ordinance requirements. So having the burden of persuasion in there is an attempt to clarify. It, it is not um, something that is going to get the UDO thrown out of court on. Uh, it's not something that um, I think is uh, absolutely necessary, and I'm going to stand here and stomp my feet if, if you decide you don't want it in there. It's one sentence. Um, and again, it's just an attempt at clarification. Do you want anything to that, Michael? Yeah, I, I need to add some additional context. Okay. Um, so currently under Section 532, and that deals with special use permits, we have language establishing uh, a burden of proof that through competent material evidence and sworn testimony, an applicant is obligated to demonstrate that he or she complies with the ordinance. And that's the statement that John was just making, that through competent material evidence and testimony, you have to prove you comply with the code. When Mr. Bryan and I, the attorney's office, were reviewing the EDO text amendment, he was he expressed a concern that similar language did not exist in sections 210 variances or 211 interpretations. So it was moved. Uh, I basically cut and pasted from section 532 the existing language, which was to his satisfaction. The issue then came down to, obviously, as John's articulated, establishing what the state statute already spells out, which is there has to be a burden of persuasion. The applicant does have the burden, the responsibility and the obligation to convince, persuade the board he or she is standing before that here's all of my evidence. This is why I should be issued the permit. That obligation exists for me not only from the competent, by the presentation of the competent material evidence and sworn testimony, but I have to show you why it demonstrates I meet the code. So that's why the language was added. Now, the planning board's concerns, which you can articulate from the minutes, but I can summarize just, just very briefly, is obviously they <coughs> expressed concern of the county attorney's office. They didn't understand how the term persuasion was going to be used. They were looking for a standard. And a lot of this can be summarized in the attorney's memorandum, attachment four of your agenda packet. Board members expressed concern, as you'll note from the minutes, that this would establish an undue burden on applicants to meet, and that it would almost compel applicants to have to hire attorneys and spend an inordinate amount of money in order to survive, as the term was, was used at the meeting on a couple of occasions, a quasi-judicial or variance proceeding. And while staff understands that, from our standpoint, we've been told by the attorney's office uh, that there is a concern over legal sufficiency. So we obviously advocated to keep the language in because our obligation is to ensure that we have an ordinance that withstands legal muster. Okay. Questions on that? Just a comment. If, I uh, wonder if I'm seeing this correctly. It seems like in almost all cases, the person would be able to make the case. It would only be in a few uh, sort of off the beaten path type uh, proposals that needed a lot more explanation that it might, you might get into the situation where you have to hire lawyers, right? Well, I'll, I'm going to answer that question, Commissioner Markopoulos, in the following manner. There's no provision in state law and there's no provision in your unified development ordinance that mandates you as an applicant have to hire an attorney. As a staff person, I don't, I have an ethical problem not advising an applicant going through a quasi-judicial legal proceeding to consult or hire an attorney. Does it mean automatic denial if they don't hire one? No. Um, I will remind you that we have had in my tenure with the county several special use permits, both at the Board of Adjustment and before you as the elected officials who had attorneys that weren't approved didn't fare well. So an, a, having an attorney is no guarantee of success. Uh, our position, however, is that having an attorney to advise you increases your chances of being successful. Well, irrespective of the attorney question, it seems like the simplification of the UDO mm -hmm. makes it easier for people to persuade 
that their use meets the... I, I would certainly hope that, but I'm also not going to... I, I also don't want to come off as if I'm discrediting the planning board's observations that they have a concern that what does this language do. Commissioner Dorsett. So again, to just to be clear, this change in the language does not change the actual burden on a applicant and what they have to show in order to get the variance or the special use permit. It does not. So that, I think that's what's really critical um, about this. And you know, um, and maybe it's the term burden of persuasion. It has legal, you know, it has a legal connotation, but. I mean, it seems pretty clear that if you're seeking a variance, you have, it's, it's, a, it's incumbent upon you to prove <clears throat> by the evidence that you present in testimony and whatever, that you meet the criteria to get that variance. Um, it's, not the, it's not the responsibility of the neighbors to say you don't meet that criteria, right? You, you, you the applicant has to show, um, has to prove that they meet the criteria. And I think um, to the extent this language is clarifying that, I think it's important. I think it's maybe also important to clarify that it, that it does not change anything substantively as far as what an applicant has to do, right? They have to, you know, the, they, have, they have the burden of showing they meet the criteria in the ordinance. And they do that by presenting the um, competent, material, competent material and substantial evidence it, you know, it just, I, I just want to be clear that no, nothing has changed as far as the actual substantive burden on any applicant under any of these provisions. That's correct. And I, I, I will want to add that the only thing that there's any, and I, and I think it's mild disagreement, but the only thing that I think there's any disagreement here is that highlighted one sentence. Uh, the rest of that paragraph uh, I do think needs to be in these additional places where it's been put. Um, but again, that, that burden of persuasion, as you just said, that language does not change anything. Commissioner Green? Well, well, I just wanted to say, given that it doesn't change anything, yeah. and it actually may provide some uh, legal support for the ordinance, <coughs> so I think it's worth keeping in, potentially with some additional when this thing rolls out with some additional explanation that nothing has changed. I mean, I, I read the planning board minutes with some interest and the, I, it seemed like the whole idea of just the word persuasion got people concerned. Like somehow all you had to do was, you know, if I could convince somebody to do this or persuade them to do that as if it was unmoored from the requirement that you have material <coughs> substan or substantial material competent evidence. And it's not, right? It's the same thing. The evidence, it's the evidence that has to be persuasive. So um, if it's competent and material and substantial, then it's persuasive. And if it's not, then it's not persuasive. So I think, to me, it seems like um, I, I appreciate, I think the discussion was a good one. And it really highlights the burden of, on us, the county, to, you know, to demystify the language to the extent possible and recognize the difference between legal connotations and popular connotations. But I do think that what's critical is nothing has changed. If you went to the planning board yesterday to get a variance, and you went to a planning board tomorrow, the day <coughs> after we adopt this to get a variance, what you have to show is exactly the same. Well, I came to the meeting agreeing that it should stay in, but on the basis of what Mr. Dorison has just reiterated and, and particularly what our attorney has said, uh, that is nothing, nothing is different, nothing has changed. Uh, I just heard our attorney say it's fine with him or he's not going to at least throw a hissy fit if we, if we take the word persuasion out. I'm, I'm coming to see the, that um, if it's not absolutely legally necessary to be there, that the planning commission, commanding board has something of a point if they think it's going to be confusing to the lay person and they don't know what it, what's the difference between proof and persuasion. So I'd be very comfortable taking it out like the planning board recommended. Can you point to where that highlighted part is in the packet that we have? The sentence that you were referring to, John? The sentence reads, <coughs> the disputed please. sentence reads, where? Uh, where? 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 It's in a link. Uh, it's in a oh, link document. Link. Okay. Yeah. So this is on <coughs> page 86, section 210, page 92, section 211, 
in page 134 in section 5.3.2. And the language that is in dispute is as follows. Further, the applicant shall have the burden of persuasion on those issues. And for context, those issues refer to the competent material evidence and sworn testimony that has to be entered into the record to justify the issuance of a variance, the approval of an interpretation, or the issuance of a special use permit. I have a question, but does the burden of proof come first before the burden yes. of persuasion? Yes, burden of proof comes first. The burden of persuasion language is after the burden of proof. It's in the same, it's in the same paragraph. Right. What section was that, 210, 2.10? 2 section 2.10, variances on page 86. Section 2.11, interpretations, page 92. And section 5.3.2, special use permits, page 134. Additional comments on this? Price. So how do you want to um, handle this? For example, I would be in favor of the changes other than uh, the pawn shops and the payday lending and some, well, there was also that inconsistency that Commissioner Markopoulos pointed out, kind of the hypocrisy of allowing, you know, something that we use as, I mean, I don't want an asphalt plant next to my house, but I mean, if we're using it, how do we you know, prohibited at the same time. So how do you want us to handle approval of this? Make the amendments first, suggested amendments to um, the planning st staff's well, recommendations? Sure. Do we feel like we've, we've talked about persuasion and proof enough yet, though? No. Because it feels as though that, that that's still, I understand where Commissioner Dorsen is coming from, and I also understand where Commissioner Green is coming from, so I'm, I'm sort of like in between. I, I brought it up because I did want, uh, like like you, Mark, I, I went through the planning board minutes. Um, well, it, I, it was important for me to understand why they were doing this. And um, they seem to have spent a lot of time talking about this, so I just didn't want to push it aside and not address it. Um, I could be convinced either way, so it's a challenge for me because I think the burden of proof is, is covers the burden of persuasion. But again, if our lawyer is telling us that it should be in there, um, I don't have a problem with that. Do you want us to move on and then we can come back to that? What would you like to, ha how would you like to handle this? I'm here at the board's pleasure. Okay. I, I know that Commissioner Markopoulos and I have talked uh, about some recommendations he has mm -hmm. and it may be fortuitous for you all to Move forward with move that. Move forward that and okay. just give us, all I ask obviously is that whatever the decision or direction is that we have. Okay. Uh, um, Madam Chair, I would like to just, I just noticed something uh, again in the minutes from the uh, planning, is it a commission or a board? Planning commission? Planning board. Yeah. Um, that a, a member, um, a member says she's confused between what's the burden of What's the difference between the burden of persuasion and the burden of proof? Y'all, I'm doing like this because I forgot my eyeglasses, yeah, something okay. like that. <laughs> um, how is adding persuasion something different than burden of proof? And so uh, Mr. Bryan, who is a lawyer, says, well, what I'm hearing is that you've added that the burden of proof is broken down into production and persuasion. And all lawyers know that the burden of proof is the burden of production plus the burden of persuasion. And that's really technical lawyer stuff. So I'm, I'm even more persuaded by it that change that it's uh, if it, it, it's all really the two elements of the burden of proof that the burden of proof is is clear and adding persuasion is just confusing i'm also persuaded by that <laughs> I, I think it's that, you know, i think the burden of proof covers it and it's not going to change as mr dorison said then may i make a suggestion sure depending on the will of the board Maybe your first action, candidly, you've already closed the public hearing. Maybe your first action is to make a rec someone make a recommendation on whether or not the language establishing the burden of persuasion, and I'll repeat the page numbers, uh, as contained in section 2.10 on page 86, 
section 2.11, page 92, section 5.3.2, page 134, that language establishing a burden of persuasion reading as follows, further the applicant shall have the burden of persuasion on those issues be stricken, if that is your pleasure. And then you move on to discuss the relevant sections of the TOPU. Okay, does someone want to make that recommendation? Okay. We'll second. second. Um, Sally, I'm sorry, Commissioner Green and Commissioner Markopoulos, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Can you see hands, please? Everybody said aye. Okay, thank you. Um, against, no? Okay, so we're going to strike that. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's move on. Commissioner Markopoulos. So we had a discussion about airports mm -hmm. and how th those uh, regulations could stand to be updated, mm -hmm. and you talked about talking to a, somebody who had their own private small airfield. Mm -hmm. Could you just refresh that for us? Yes, yeah, certainly. As this board may recall uh, from a couple, not only independent meetings I've had with you, but in a couple presentations, there was a conscious effort to, currently an airport is allowed uh, through the approval of a Class A special use permit in the rural buffer, agricultural residential, and rural residential general use zoning districts. It was decided that we really don't want airports in the residential zoning districts, so this amendment package eliminates them from the RB, AR, and R1 and would allow them in the industrial I-1, I-2, I-3 instead through a Class A special use permit. The question was posed to me uh, during several of our independent meetings, should we develop regulations and standards not only governing the development of a private airfield for personal use, but should we not update our airport regulations, which are several decades old? Uh, I will remind you that uh, the staff on two occasions has attempted to do that uh, and unfortunately did not meet uh, with a lot of public support. Uh, I think our timing could have been better as we were trying to address this issue at the time UNC was going to be looking to develop an airport facility. Uh, but I agree with Commissioner Markopoulos that it may, there may need to be additional review of those standards. And again, I'll remind you what the TOPU was designed to do, what this project is designed to do, is address the immediate need of clarifying the table of permitted uses. Uh, we had already indicated to you in past meetings that we knew we were going to have to come back and do additional modifications uh, to the text as we move forward. And that is certainly one area where additional study would be needed. So my neighborhood was pretty stirred up over the airports. It was not a good idea to have that scale of an airport, but I could see a, a small personal airport landing strip more than an airport mm -hmm. if we could you know learn how we might allow something like that that would not be intrusive be worth considering and then the one other thing just we also talked about um, alternative energy how we might do as little as we can to stand in the way of viable alternative energy and it seemed like like, like conventional wisdom is that wind power doesn't work out in the Piedmont but that mm -hmm. conventional wisdom is wrong mm -hmm. and we need we need to have some understanding of that and some regulations around wind turbines mm -hmm. I think so that people know I mean we should have more and I suspect we will have more as we move forward Correct. Current policy obviously deals primarily with solar panels. Uh, we had attempted a comprehensive review back when uh, Manager Clifton was here. Uh, we were directed at that time to focus on solar panels because that was the identified immediate concern to try to ensure and allow for the development of those. But expansion of existing utility regulations to include additional alternative energies is something that you should probably do. So again, to summarize what I've heard, and it may be appropriate for the board to take action on the separate from the table permitted use action is that you want staff to further study potential allowance and development of regulations for pawn shops and payday lending um, give a additional review to products and services that we use the example was asphalt plants i know that's not include that's not exclusively just asphalt plants um, but you've asked us to re-examine the table and land uses uh, to ensure that we can have products locally that we use locally. The asphalt plant was the example. 
um, that you want us to pay additional attention to the animal processing and slaughterhouses currently listed in the manufacturing land use category, that you would like a comprehensive review of existing airport regulations, including potential allowances for private airfields, airstrips, however, whatever vernacular we want to allow for them, and you want us to begin exploring ways of incorporating additional alternative energy policy in the code. That's something that obviously can be done. It's not going to be done for this amendment packet because that's going to, that, that exceeds what I think our mandate was when we first were assigned the project in 2017. But it certainly does address, I think, some of the concerns I've heard this evening where you think there may be some deficiencies that need continuing study. So that could be its own independent motion as an example to direct staff to begin that process. Mr. Dorson. Well, I, I have a lot of questions about that. Uh, proposal. I don't support approving payday lending at all. I think those facilities prey on people. I think it's, I think they should be banned. I think they should be banned everywhere. I don't think we should allow them in the county. Um, like I said, I don't think they should be allowed anywhere. I think they're usurious. Um, I know some people depend on them, but I don't think that, you know, I don't think that we should facilitate the, um, you know, that cycle of intensive poverty that draws people in. Um, when you say things we use, do you mean the county, that the county buys? Do you mean that people who live in the county use? I, I, that seems like stuff we use seems like a very ambiguous category of, I mean, you know, does that mean, it just seems very broad. And I, I'm a little concerned about that language. Um, you know, if we're just talking about exploring these things, I guess it'd be worth doing, but I don't, I don't really see myself supporting people being able to, I don't know how you have a private airfield that doesn't adversely impact people who live nearby. Uh, I understand that, you know, I, I think we've got a lot of, we, we are regularly confronting the kind of stuff that happens in the county that we don't have the power to regulate um, and that has adverse impacts on neighbors, like people shooting guns and things like that, for example. So. I, I, I have a hard time understanding, you know, the, the, the meat thing is a little different. That seems more specific and narrowly focused, but, um, but some of those, so obviously we're not endorsing anything in those regards tonight, which I understand, but I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying I, I would need more information, particularly about what that means, what we use. I mean, I think the alternative energy one is clear enough. Uh, I think, I guess the airport one is clear enough, although I don't, I won't, probably wouldn't support any changes. The, but the, the, industri the, the meat processing is clear enough. The stuff we use one, I think, is, is a little uh, squishy. Um, you know, so uh, I think it would be, it would be good. I'd like to see a list of what those are before we turn, turn the staff loose on that. Yeah, I kind of agree. I, I don't, I don't, Barry Jacobs is turning over right now as we talk about asphalt, but I, I, I don't know that I can agree that we should have an asphalt plant here either. So I, I think that, I think that's right. I think we should maybe come back before we make a motion to, <coughs> to have you and staff spend time on things. Um, maybe we, maybe you need more direction on what to spend time on. Yeah, John. Uh, as I previously mentioned to you, we've also been working with uh, planning to uh, look at other things in the UDO that could be streamlined or clarified and was planning on putting that in an uh, information item uh, but we could also work with Michael on these ob these subjects to um, come back and have a more full discussion over all of that I think that's probably a good idea yep. um, yeah. oh, Sally first. first okay um, well, I, I agree that a lot of these proposals are not, uh, are very, I'm not sure I would support like the asphalt or the, uh, I'm not sure I would support the pawn shops, but the payday lending, I, I'd like to say, let's just don't even think about that. Wasn't there a state law against it for a while before it got, it was yeah, trying. yeah, it yeah, be. yeah. So that, that one to me is just non-starter. The others I'm willing to consider with more or less enthusiasm, but the, pay, the payday <laughs> lending, no, no way. Commissioner Markopoulos? Yeah, yeah, I'd say yeah, definitely no to the payday lending, but I think the point is with the things we use, I don't think that's the heading of the section of the UDO. It's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think we, we take it on a case-by-case -case basis. So if we, if we say, yes, we think, um, you know, a slaughterhouse, meat processing facility, 
uh, ought to be explored to see if it can fit into the county because we utilize that service. That's a specific thing. I think we could specifically look at asphalt. I mean, the thing is we can come back with, it doesn't hurt to withhold judgment on it until we find out all the details of how it could fit in what to the county, we, or if it doesn't. We, uh, we, the county, uses a meat processing plant that we would be... No, as commi as commissioners, there? we can decide. So we may decide that no, an asphalt plant has no place in Orange County. You know, we, we may find that there are no regulations that make it work to um, our satisfaction, right? But it, it doesn't hurt to explore the issue, right? We're not saying we endorse it. But I think my point is, is that we should at least explore, do these things fit in? You know, you don't want to, it's, you know, it's like you're living on the city on the hill and the dirty work is being done elsewhere to bring you your quality of life. And that, that's sort of the core issue for me. And I think we just ought to explore if we can make it work. It's not what, it's how. And, and the UDO is a live document, right? It, it could be changed and updated at any point. Yes, ma'am. So any, anything can be explored at any point. Anyone, Correct. Any one of us could bring up something to look into. Let, let me just say, obviously, I don't, I don't think it's, it's a waste of, of, of staff resources to provide your report and assessment and ask you for that feedback once, and, and, I, and I will put this, 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 this qualifier on it, once we have an updated table of permitted uses, because then we're all working within the same format. Okay. So the goal tonight is to move on this. Um, I, I, does anyone else have any other questions? I just want to bring it to everyone's attention that um, Anthony Carey did send us an email um, about his concerns about the short-term rentals, um, and he specifically um, <clears throat> stated the, the allows non-host occupy, occupied dwellings which provide guest rooms for overnight rental lease is not occupied by host. So I, I think that they have in the towns, it's very different than it is in the county. And um, I, I'm actually fine with the way this is written. I don't know if Lori wants to add anything to this, but we've, we've had hours and hours of discussion about this. And um, I, I think that you and I talked about this, Michael. I think that what we have in this ordinance uh, covers what Anthony is saying. Uh, I believe so, yes. Okay. Do, Lori, is there any update on that? Did you want to add anything to that? Well, while she's coming up, yeah. can you just, John, answer if the, I thought you said that they couldn't be regulated. What couldn't be that, regulated? That uh, Airbnbs couldn't be, uh, no, couldn't I, be restricted. Uh, no, I sent a memo to the board of how we can regulate them. And I think there are uh, three ways, uh, time and place, um, manner. There, there are ways to regulate them, yes. Uh, and I, I sent that to the board a couple of weeks ago. And so this provision that's in here um, basically prohibits them if the host doesn't live there? In, in a specific area. So there's, a, there's only specific areas in, in Orange County that an Airbnb can exist, correct? Correct. Yeah. And how is that enforced? By reporting? by someone reporting a violation? Uh, same way all uh, zoning matters are uh, investigated, there's either a report uh, and the staff is obligated to come up with the necessary evidence to prove that there is a violation and then proceeds accordingly. And so it, uh, just to remind the, the board of what I sent, um, there are three ways to regulate this use. <coughs> One is this, you know, <coughs> through zoning. Uh, the appropriate zone is what uh, is the only place where this can occur. Uh, the other would be uh, operational, such as parking, insurance, inspections, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and, and the last would be quantitative restrictions, you know, caps on the number of uses within the zone or the distance they are from each other, like, like occur with other things. So uh, those are the three manners, and, and this one is, is actually the locational, the geographic restriction. And that's the only one that wouldn't require some kind of advanced registration. Those other two would require someone who wanted to do it to notify the county and say, I'm going to do this and here's how I'm going to meet whatever those requirements are. Yes, sir. 
Laura, you want to add to something? Thanks. So briefly, one of the advisory boards that you make possible is the Orange County Visitor Bureau. And the subject of short-term rentals and the shared economy has really exploded across the country and in North Carolina, and as a result has trickled down to the advisory board's uh, radar screen, and they have developed a subcommittee of accommodations and local business to study it. And you know, in summary, what we found is that the short-term rental industry in Orange County has exploded. Right now, there are about 300 dwellings listed on Airbnb, and uh, last year they generated nine million dollars. And the growth is just is is taking off so quickly that it forced the board, the advisory board, to look at it to say, wait a minute now. You know, there's one thing about a mother-in-law suite or, or a room on the dwelling you're living in being rented to visitors, there's this whole other trend happening out there. And this is really the issue where apartments, and we're seeing a lot of growth in apartments here now, um, the trend is that these non-occupied units, which owners are living out of state and just buying for investment properties, are now being listed as a hotel accommodation. So you don't have any inspections, you don't have any of the safety measures put in place that the traditional accommodations have to follow. There's concerns about safety. There's a, we're starting to see a trend where people are buying homes and putting it on Airbnb, which really starts to impact the, the affordable rental market. So it's not Airbnb in and of itself, that's a concern when you look at the type of Airbnb that many of us have, uh, homes out back that we're renting out. It's the fact that these out-of-state investors are now buying these units, putting them on the market, and there's no real regulation, safety, oversight. I mean, it's one thing to say they're competing with hotels. Okay, that, that's a different argument. But they're also starting to take away from jobs. They're starting to take away from concerns that even our board has. Um, Aaron Bockenheimer on our board recently, and this is one of thousands of stories, needed room in Boone. He and his wife got there. They found it at Airbnb last minute because like this area, it's a college town and all the hotels were booked. And there's three cats in the bed and there's, there's problems with um, videos and, and showers, and we're starting to hear this enormous amount of concern. And in this area in Orange County, where safety, of course, is of critical concern, it's the non-owner dwellings that are skyrocketing and a concern. The rural part of the equation is that we're starting to see a lot of weddings and event business, as you know, move outside to the, the barns, the um, non-traditional facilities. So there's some concern there as we see that erosion leaving the traditional accommodations for investing a lot in our county. You know, are there rooms being added out there? Uh, what's gonna happen in the future? And as we watch the trend again, they are approaching Chapel Hill and Carborough on regulations. And since this is a separate but parallel discussion, uh, we wanted this board to be aware of that. So. so does that help, Mark? I mean, Commissioner Dorson. You know, I don't, I mean, we know all, it's, it's, it, I appreciate the input, but I'm not sure how I feel about resolving it. You know? Yeah, I, I, and I agree because, um, Lori and I have also had this conversation is that you're not going to stop it. They're, the Airbnbs are here to stay. People enjoy it. People are going to use them. Um, the regulations that we, that we have um, that, we, the, that we can utilize, we should. Um, uh, besides that, you know, um, I, I really do think it's a municipal, more of a municipal problem than it is out in the county. Yeah. And um, I, I think that this covers what we're talking about. Yeah. As far as enforcement is concerned, though, I, I think enforcement is troubling um, because if someone is not going to call to say that there's a loud party going on, right, it's hard to the enforce. bigger cities in our state are the ones that are really tackling this. Specifically, Asheville uh, downtown, they've 
banned Airbnbs because with all the development going up with the apartments, the investors did come in and just put three, four, five floors on Airbnb, and it was creating quite an issue. We're seeing it in Charlotte. Raleigh's tackling this now. Um, and, you know, at this point, as of this day, Durham has taken a very different approach. Durham has said, hey, they're here. They're, the, the state has an agreement with Airbnb to collect and remit taxes. We're not going to regulate it right now. What we're going to do is ask our visitor bureau to bring in all the Airbnb dwellings and talk to them about the different restaurants and use those visitors in these dwellings to help the economy. So you're right, Commissioner, in that it's a very local issue and uh, people are handling it different and it's new and we're all being surprised by it and there's a lot of divergent views on it. But um, really just a courtesy, I think Commissioner Rich wanted me to tell you what's going on with one of the advisory boards you have in place. Yeah, no, I appreciate that and I appreciated the email that we got as well. I, um, yeah, has anybody challenged that Asheville ban? Is that, is they're gonna, is there, do they expect to be sued over that? I don't know. I don't know. I think the Airbnb issue is changing as we speak mm -hmm. this minute. Uh, every day there's a new update, there's a new, a new conundrum, there's a new challenge, a pushback. Um, so I think we're all living in the midst of this shared economy and it's playing out daily. But I'd be happy to follow up and get you that, and that answer to that question. It'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Um, okay, is everyone ready to move on or additional questions? I have a question. Commissioner Price. I don't have it in front of me right now, but the letter from Anthony Carey, I believe he asked that we wait until, was it Chapel Hill or Carborough vote on it or come up with some resolution themselves so that we'd be in, uh, be consistent with them? Can I respond to that? Sure. Uh, you know, county has a different set of <laughs> issues, opportunities, constraints than municipalities. And, and I don't think that our regulation ought to mirror or be based on Chapel Hill Carborough that deals with a totally separate set of development criteria, opportunities, and constraints. I think that you have a policy that is currently reflected in the Unified Development Ordinance that you have adopted. I think it serves you well. And I think that there's no need, in my humble opinion, to change the current policy. And what um, Anthony is saying in his letter is that they, they haven't submitted their report yet. Um, and so they, they were urging us not to vote on this tonight. But, um, but like we just said, this is a, a living document. Mm -hmm. And if we find after we get the report, if we find we want to change something, we can. Yes. Um, you direct staff to initiate a text amendment and staff right. obviously complies. Right. So we can tell him that and I think he'll be okay with it. As a matter of fact, I'll see him in the morning. Um, well, and didn't his letter say that they were okay with the with the host occupied ones? Yes, they absolutely are. So, yes. yeah. so, what we're doing is consistent with what he's right, right. Currency yeah, that's the difference. Yeah. And that's what that's the difference between the county and municipal, municipalities as well, because we're finding that the, you know, uh, for example, the 140. There's a couple of apartments that are bed and breakfast uh, that are, are uh, Airbnbs at that apartment complex. They're always. When it starts affecting affordable housing, though, I think we're going to have to really look at it. I, and I think the municipalities, though. I mean, I don't think it's a county issue. I do think it's a, it's a town issue. So. Um, all right. So we have, um, we have to, uh, Michael, you're going to guide me through this, right? We're going to approve, sorry, I'm. That's my, okay. My There's already broken. been a motion approved unanimously to remove the uh, burden of persuasion language. There we go. Uh, so that's what, there. What you're being asked to do is approve the statement of consistency in attachment six. Okay. Then you're being asked to approve the now revised ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as contained in Attachment se seven. 7, removing the burden of persuasion language right. from Sections 5, or excuse me, 210, 211, and 5.3.2. Right. And then obviously any follow-up uh, after taking action on TOPU, <coughs> directing staff to provide you any follow-up on some of the comments tonight on the additional land uses and get your feedback on potential ordinance amendments. And as Mr. Roberts has reminded you, we are already working on numerous EDO text amendments to address not only pending changes in state law, but to address streamlining of the UDO. Okay, that's great. And John, can we vote on that all together? 
Uh, no, I, uh, on this one, I think you need okay. to vote on the statement of consistency first and, and then follow up with the ordinance. Okay, so let's have a motion on the state of consistency. That's a, a attachment six. I move attachment six, the statement of consistency with the comprehensive plan. Okay, it's moved by Green, second by... Second. Mark Hopless, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Okay. Then we are going to move to um, adopt the ordinance as recommended by Planning Director, um, and that is 7, 7A, 7B, 7C. And it has as modified by the board. Has, has been modified by the board. Thank you. So John coming, he's like, don't forget that modified. Okay. And as modified by the board. So we need a motion for that. So move. Commissioner McKee, seconded by? Second. Second, second another one. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Okay, and that passes. Thank you, Michael. Thank you all. Appreciate it. I would just like Commissioner. Yeah, Pierce. if we could just consider what we're doing when we say that we're prohibiting pawn shops. I'm not into the payday line, I'm totally against that. But on that pawn shop, because we have, you know, one of our schools benefits greatly from, from the contributions from pawn shops, that I think we're. we're we risk sending a, a, a negative message to, to, to folks when we're prohibiting people from even coming in. I'm not, I'm not saying I support. What, what I've heard you all ask, including you, Commissioner Price, is for, you to, for us to give you a report identifying those land uses and seeking additional guidance as we continue to move forward. Yes, because I'm, I'm really concerned about the message, you know, the, the impression that we're giving to other people outside. They said, we don't want you in, even though you have you know, helped us, helped our, you know, students at middle school. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Okay, let's move on to the regular agenda. Um, Actually helping them by pro prohibiting their competitors. <laughs> no, no, they've given a big chunk of money and they've supported the, the bands and the orchestra. Okay, 6A, potential, ad um, potential additional in, of environmental impact section to the agenda and abstract. And this is um, Brennan and Dave. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm Brennan Bauma, the County Sustainability Coordinator, um, and I'm uh, presenting tonight on uh, the potential addition of uh, environmental impact section to all county agenda abstracts. Um, as you may recall, you last considered this issue in November of 2018, and at that time you provided feedback to staff and proposed that the Commission for the Environment, uh, which looked at this subject several years ago, review and advise of the topic. Since that time, the CFE has provided feedback, and I'm presenting tonight on the manager's recommendations based on their feedback. So just uh, for some, some context, here is the, uh, the, the current agenda abstract template. I, I think you know this one very well. Um, and, the, uh, and moving forward here is the proposed abstract template. So, um, what's being recommended is just the basic addiction, addition of uh, the term environmental impact. This is, uh, forgive me, just a, a zoomed in portion below that, uh, that black line. Um, so again, just the addition of environmental impact as a section. Um, to, oh, excuse me, to assist staff in, um, in determining what um, should go into that section, um, uh, staff has prepared and, and the commission reviewed um, uh, four categories that summarize the 10 objectives of the county's 2010 adopted environmental responsibility goal. Um, so these prompts are written to, to help non-environmental staff uh, from feeling like they, they have to perform a technical environmental analysis. Um, they're, all, they're meant to be higher in nature. Um, and, and that is done to help clarify that the environmental impacts um, identified in this section of county abstracts are not meant to replace or conflict 
uh, with any impact assessments required by local, state, or federal regulation. Um, the, the, county's plan, the county's planning department has voiced concerns over potential confusion created by this section, and the manager's recommendation helps to address those concerns. So just a quick summary. Um, the manager's recommendation is uh, simple and easy for staff to fill out. Um, it maintains that open response format um, that the CFE recommended. Uh, and for, for development processes with major environmental impacts, there are already federal and state local ordinances and processes that are followed. And the board obviously can always request more information or details about any uh, item's potential environmental impact. Um, and so the manager recommends that the board consider moving forward with the abstract template provided at attachment four and the environmental impact prompts provided in attachment five, uh, which are based on the county's environmental responsibility goal. Great. Questions? Um, comments? Yes. Um, right. We're comments. No questions. Are we? Do we have? Are okay. you going to let? Are there people here to? Do something? People? I don't think there's any questions. No, I'm in. No, I always want to wait for people <laughs> out there. Okay. Um, I, I'm. I'm really. Shouldn't it somewhere say something like avoid production of greenhouse gases? I would add that to energy efficiency, and I don't know where I would add it, but um, it seems it, it seems it's missing. I mean, you say avoid production of greenhouse gases or make use of renewable energy, one or the other. I mean, I think that would be. Where are you proposing that? Well, at first I was proposing it in number one as, okay. you know, conserve energy, reduce resource consumption, increase the use of recycle, minimize waste streams, and avoid production of greenhouse gas. Um, but that, you know, that's not, it, that, that, that's neither energy efficiency nor waste reduction. It's, uh, is producing a different kind of energy that's not toxic to the environment. So maybe it goes under clean or, because my other issue is clean or avoided transportation. That section seems to really be about avoided transportation, but not much about clean transportation. So maybe that's where it goes. What about the last one? Yeah, what about in the last the one? The last one result. Yeah, okay, yeah, 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 okay. Address it where possible mitigate adverse impacts created on natural resources of the site and adjoining area. Mitigation impacts created. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't quite cover it. But if you go down, it talks about the impact on air quality, particulates. Are you reading? Oh, I've just got this one. I'm just looking at uh, attachment five, which is what we're supposed to be looking at. What if you just said resultant impact on natural resources and climate change? Just change the title of that fourth one. Um, and then, you know, and, and then added something after the, you know, added a, a, some, a clause yeah, at the end. Yeah, that, that's close. I'd like something better than climate change. Maybe um, um, well, clim uh, and, on natural resources and resultant, I don't know. I need some help here. Um, well, what you're not seeing it, underneath, there's a bullet at least in the electronic version, it says suggested metrics, estimated, Im and it's really small, <laughs> uh, estimated metrics, e um, estimated impact on water quality, e.g. Uh, water temperature, suspended sediment, nutrients, dissolved oxygen, pH, etc., or quantity, such as gallons per day, estimated impact on air quality, meaning s uh, smell, dust, ozone, particulates such as uh, PM2.5 from combustion emissions, etc. Loss of natural habitat for plants and animals. I don't it know. It just seems wrong. like something fundamental that's missing about renewable energy or avoiding greenhouse gases. Well, how about saying that? Yeah. Resultant impact on natural resources, uh, alternative energy, and avoiding greenhouse gases. Commissioner Markopoulos. So you, you, you know what we're getting at. Is there is there some sort of a simple-ish formula that would 
or, make or maybe, that? Yeah, go ahead. Certainly. Easily no. done? So um, I guess a point of clarification, one thing I, I heard uh, Commissioner Price mention, uh, I believe you were reading off of attachment two, right. which was the, the version that came from the, the, the Commission for the Environment, and that is not the recommended version going forward. Yeah, it's just um, a simpler one. So, so the suggested metrics piece have, have been removed. Right. Oh, I thought to, it was for right. clarification. Right. So, so, so uh, uh, but to Commissioner Markopoulos's question, um, these these prompts were created um, in, in in the staff's best <coughs> effort to summarize what had already been adopted by the board um, in, in that 2000, 2010, uh, excuse mm -hmm. me, two thousand five environmental responsibility goal. But um, these prompts are are ours to create. I'm happy to create a. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I have a thought here. How about resultant impact on natural resources and air quality? And then add, uh, for assess where possible mitigate adverse Im impacts created to natural resources at the site and adjoining area, um, avoid production of greenhouse gases, period. Or minimize production of greenhouse gases, one or the other. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm happy to take dictation from the, the, the meeting recording and, yeah. and, and make that okay. change. Okay, thank you. Okay, I like that. Um, additional comments, questions? Commissioner Rickey. Yes, the board will do what the board is going to do. I'm going to vote against it for the same reasons I expressed before. None of this is either going to add to or detract from any of the actions we do. It's simply going to clutter up an already cluttered agenda abstract uh, as in the next abstract which is two pages this would be about a half a page of just simple statements reiterating what our goals already state so uh, basically I, I don't really consider this worth doing now vote against it I think it's a good way to uh, help us and the public focus on aspects of the issues that relate to all these environmental effects and the way I look at it is it'll it'll get better as we use it right I mean you'll have a better idea of how to express it we'll have questions it'll just evolve so I think this is a good start and we ought to go with it Commissioner Green just quickly I think it's good to have it on our uh, uh, list on stated clearly on our impacts just to keep it front and center in our minds Okay. Sounds like we're there. We're going to go with attachment five, so I need approval on that. I mean, I'm sorry, I need a motion on that with the changes by Commissioner Green, and you're going to get that wording down perfectly, right? So Second. moved. Second. Okay, Commissioner Dorson, Commissioner Green, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? No. Okay. That is five, one. And um, let's see, we're going to go to B. <coughs> This is uh, to authorize the chair to sign a letter to North Carolina Association of County Commissioners expressing Orange County's preference to align its Medicaid tailored plan with re regional with Durham and Wake counties. Um, and Travis is here. And this was brought to us by uh, Commissioner Bedford. That's correct. Uh, so the state had asked NCACC to help organize some uh, a methodology to receive feedback on how the tailored plan regions are composed. Uh, they have done that. Uh, the deadline for responding is April 17th, which is tomorrow. Uh, so this was a petition by Commissioner Bedford to uh, express the Orange County preference as uh, to align with uh, Durham and Wake counties, uh, primarily because of the shared workforce, uh, shared transportation network, and uh, largely the same network of providers. So uh, we have drafted a letter, uh, and the board's action would be to authorize the chair to sign the letter on behalf of the entire board. Questions for Travis? Can you remind us where we're grouped now? So. For behavioral health purposes, we're, we're in the Cardinal Innovations MCO region. And that doesn't include Durham and Wake. Right. Uh, Durham and Wake are in the Alliance <coughs> MCO region. But it does include Mecklenburg, I believe. That's right. West and south. And commissioners, we, um, 
received a letter this afternoon um, detailing uh, from uh, Mr. Sutton uh, some of the, some of the um, actions they take place that Colonel Invasion does and uh, supplies uh, support for us locally. Um, do either of you want to make a statement? You didn't sign up. I don't see anyone signed up. Uh, but if I could just have one minute. Sure. sure. So while he's coming up, yeah. so if this changes, that means we wouldn't be with Cardinal anymore? We would be with Alliance? That's right. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the opportunity. My name is Trey Sutton. I'm Chief Executive Officer for Cardinal Innovations. And, uh, you know, I'll keep the comments very brief because uh, I've outlined a lot of this in detail in that email. Um, so first, I'd ask you to consider the members. There's a tremendous amount of tumult in the system already uh, with regard to standard plans commercial insurers coming into the state. And, uh, and so I would just ask you to consider the disruption or the potential disruption to members and families as they realign with new providers, and uh, in particular new care coordinators. So that would be one thing I would ask you to, to think <coughs> about. Um, two, I know that there's been some discussion about geography uh, and realigning with the triangle. What I'll say about our provider network is it does include UNC, uh, Wake Med, as well as Duke, and a lot of the other providers in, in both alliances and uh, in Cardinal's network. Um, and then three, what I would say is that uh, Cardinal historically has had a very strong commitment to Orange County. Uh, in fact, last year, um, we, so we receive capitation and there's care costs associated with our members. So effectively, Department of uh, Health and Human Services gives us a certain amount of money for our members and, and we deliver care costs associated with those members. Uh, just for Orange County, we received capitation of $26 million last year, but we spent $35.4 million. Um, so if this were a business, effectively, we would have lost $9.4 million. But it's, it's not a business, right? Uh, it's a, it's a mission-focused organization and one that has a commitment to this county. Um, in addition to uh, being a little underwater on our care costs last year, uh, we also made uh, a number of investments in, in community organizations through our community reinvestment project. Those included uh, Compass Center for Women and Families, El Futuro, YMCA of the Triangle, Special Olympics, and that's not including either state funding, which is additional millions of dollars, uh, and I, can, I don't have those exact numbers, but can share them with the, with the commissioners, as well as a commitment of $500,000 for Club Nova, uh, which we all know does great work. Lastly, what I'll say just about our commitment and presence in Orange County is that we have e at least as many employees in the, in the local uh, area as we do in some of our other counties. We also have an office here, and in fact, our board meeting, our next board meeting is here in Chapel Hill uh, on next Friday. So, uh, and I would be happy, to in, uh, I'd be happy to welcome you into that board meeting. So what I would say is that the stakes of this decision are high, um, and I would just ask you to consider it in, in that light. Uh, stakes are high for our members, as well as our county. Um, I just wouldn't want you to make a decision, I guess, without some of that information. I'm happy to answer questions or uh, return with more information, if that would be useful. Uh, questions for Mr. Seth? Sure. Um, I talked with you on Friday morning at the Chamber event, and I'd, I'd appreciate it if you could uh, relay to, to all of us uh, the kinds of things you were telling me about, first of all, how long you've been in charge sure. and what kinds of things you've had to go to, to frankly, to address some of the problems that we've all uh, heard about over the past few years. No, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to burn my time talking about um, the things that I've been focused on. I joined Cardinal Innovations about 18 months ago, a month prior to the Department of Health and Human, uh, Human Services rating, Cardinal Innovations. Uh, in fact, I got the text from Dave Richard when he was down in the lobby and said, you know, down here with State Bureau of Investigations uh, uh, folks or agents. And uh, they came up, handed me a letter uh, dissolving our board, escorting four of our executives out of the building and asking me to step in on an interim CEO role. Uh, prior to that role, I had been the CFO at uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Since taking the position, we've reconstituted our board, implemented our corrective action plan. Um, we've gotten that signed off by the department. And in fact, we, we did both our corrective action plan as well as reconstitute the board in about 60 days. Subsequent to that, we, we started uh, what we call internally our five pillars, or basically our strategic plan. 
And the five focus areas of our strategic plan have been one, our members. We gotta put our members first and we gotta design our network, our reimbursement strategies, and our clinical practice guidelines around exactly what our members need. <clears throat> two, we need to do a better job of working with our members or with our, with our providers, excuse me, uh, by reducing administrative burden, making work, working with Cardinal a lot more like breathing rather than getting a hole in the head. Uh, we also gotta make reimbursement more favorable for our providers and we're doing that. In fact, we've got um, a pilot launching with eight providers to do value-based payments and incentive payments for those providers. But we also have to hold them accountable. But that's the second big pillar, so members and providers. Third is our, is our communities. And what we're doing right now is we're going about doing uh, county 360s. And so we've hired an independent person who used to be a county commissioner, Karen Bentley, to go and visit with local leaders in our 20 uh, counties to collect feedback on what we're doing poorly and what we're doing well. We're identifying the common themes across our 20 counties. And I've committed the board to execute on two top priorities for at least three counties. Uh, our, our strategic plan was only approved after six months into the year, and so I thought that was a feasible um, uh, ambition for the, for the remaining period of time. But we're certainly gonna ramp that up next year. Uh, number four is we gotta in invest in our employees. I think here to four, um, you know, we have, uh, we've not put the dollars or the training into the folks inside the organization that we need to. And so one, we're doing a lot of management training. Uh, one, you know, Folks need to, managers need to be able to look our employees in the eye and say you get an F and here's the reason that you got an F. Um, or folks on our front line, they need to know what good customer service looks like. So we're doing a lot of training in those areas. <laughs> and then lastly, number five, the fifth pillar is getting ready for a tailored plan. So beginning in July 2021, we'll be responsible for integrated care for all our members. And so we are, uh, we are ramping up, and, and that gets back to some of the training, uh, but we're ramping up to make sure that we are prepared to provide integrated care for our, for our members, meaning uh, medical care as well as pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical benefits. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner McKee? Yes, sir. You mentioned a $9 million deficit for Orange County. Yes, sir. I would be interested in what your overall balance sheet profit loss was. Uh, last year we lost approximately $30 million. Uh, this year we're on track to lose a little bit less than that, but we've, we've re reallocated some of our fund balance to cover that shortfall this year. Okay, that's um, rather surprising to me. I, I sat on your local board several years back, found the corporate board, the corporate entity to be fairly difficult to deal with. Uh, I'm aware of families that are still having issues getting the services that their children need and their adult clients need. Uh, you mentioned Club Nova. It is a very good organization, but it was like pulling teeth to get uh, Cardinal Innovations to step up where they, to where they should be at. Commissioner, I would disagree. Club Nova spent a fair amount of time at our board meetings. Uh, we always welcome them into our board meetings, including our finance meetings. They were always welcome, and I've always entertained all their requests. In fact, I'm trying to schedule a visit in person, talk to Representative Insco on multiple occasions about Club Nova, and we remain absolutely committed to that 500 grand that we've promised them. I hope so. Yeah, we, we'll deliver on that commitment. Commissioner Dorsen? Well, I was just, I think Commissioner Price is our representative now on, on that, is that right? Oh, it is Commissioner Bedford. Sorry. Yeah, she's on there. Oh, okay. Were you, were you the last one on there? Yes. And then so, there's also community, no, County Commissioner Advisory Board. So I was just going to see if, if, if as the most, since Commissioner Bedford's not here, as the most recent rep, if you had any thoughts on this, on the letter and the, you know, what you, if you had any ideas or insights. Well, I w well, the, there's a difference, of course, because Commissioner Bedford actually uses the services and I don't. But I will say this, that I was on the board during the transition, and it's like light, night and day. Um, the, the, the previous director, the, the whole structure, the whole field was much more corporate. And, um, and even listening to some of the people in the CFAC, you know, they were struggling, but um, during the, I think with the transition, it's been a entirely different. I've been on conference calls and in meetings with Secretary Cohen, and she feels good about, I mean, she's trying to move, I shouldn't say she feels, she's trying to move this along to where it should be. 
And, we, and I, I would say that it's going to take a while to change. I mean, you can't just change it overnight. Um, I agree with, you know, some of the concerns about geography, but I've also noticed um, in another situation, one county wanted to break away from where they were and, you know, the manager showed me the letter, they broke away. I don't know, you know, they thought the grass was going to be greener on the other side. Um, but I think in all cases it turns out to be the same. Uh, and a lot of the changes that um, need to be made actually have to come from the state level. It's, you know, the thing about the waivers, the number of slots for the waivers, that, that isn't something that we can control locally, it comes from the state. We are partnering with INSCO on some language that would, so because of historical allocation methodologies, uh, Orange County is about 20, 26% above the <coughs> per capita. Um, my understanding is that Representative INSCO is introducing some legislation that would disregard kind of the prior allocation methodology and just say on a go forward basis, here's how it's going to be done. And, and we did partner with her on some language. So when was the deadline of April 17th set as an input deadline? Uh, so that was set when back in maybe September when the when they first created these committees. It's it's a NCACC imposed deadline, uh, but it is a deadline. A oh, question. Isn't that to be in, in line with the, the, what he's asking, but isn't that in line with the getting ready for November? Everything I believe asked? that's the, that's the rationale, yeah. It's, well, it's not arbitrary. I just feel like it's two days away and I got more questions than answers. Yeah. That's, that's really where I'm at. I just, uh, don't know if it's possible for me to really resolve how I feel about yeah. this right now or even in two days. I don't know why it only came up now or if, you know, maybe some other entity in the government was dealing with it. Um, and I'd like to know what their perspective is because I don't have a perspective, a meaningful perspective right now. Um, how often do you get to change? Is it a year by year basis that you can change? Rick, maybe you can help with the disengagement process. Hey, can you just tell us who you are? Rick Bruton, uh, Cardinal Innovation Healthcare. So my understanding is uh, the initial, so it's going to be um, standard plans will be commercial insurers. They will have a contract period of four years. Same thing with Taylor plans coming in, they will have a contract period. So my understanding is that during the initial contract phase of the Taylor plans, there will be no changes. The only opportunity will come after the next <coughs> contract cycle. That's my understanding. So it's a four-year it's a four-year commitment. Right. And, and and I just because I'm up here, I'd like to echo um, what Commissioner Price said. Being an employee of Cardinal, I've been here for nine years. Totally difference with this board, this new CEO. It's it is night and day. <coughs> Well, commissioners, what? And, well, and who I'll, makes the decision? Do we know? Like, this is a letter requesting, uh, this is a letter to the NCACC uh, saying we want to, if we approve it, that we want to go in, with in, in these other counties. And who actually will make the decision to do that? That's something the state DHHS will make? Commissioner Green? Um, like Commissioner Mercopoulos, I, I'm, this is a, a world I don't know much about, but I would not, based on what I have heard, I would not tonight be comfortable with changing from Cardinal because I, I just think that they've, uh, um, it sounds like they are, they are, have turned over a new leaf and it would be very disruptive to change them and I don't know anything about where we're going and so I just, uh, I, I can't do this tonight. Yeah, um, Madam Chair and Commissioners, the um, the letter would be a letter of support 
as you know what it is, a letter to support that we go with Wake and Durham. However, that will not guarantee that we will. So this is just sending the letter to the NCACC. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but I just want clear, I wanted to clarify that with you. That doesn't mean that that's what happens. I, it probably would hold quite a bit of weight, but um, that they're gathering the information as far as I know. I'm correct on that, right? Yeah, they're gathering information from all counties. Um, and we, the reason that this is so close to the deadline is because in talking with social services and um, working with Car Travis, who is our point person at the staff level, works with Rick very closely, we, we were not going to send a, a letter of support or non-support. We were just going to see what happened in the process. And then Commissioner Bedford requested that we actually um, present you all with that decision as to whether you send a letter to the NCACC for consideration in their, um, in the state going forward in this process. And Bonnie, can I just ask you a question? The process meaning that we could be, we could be switched without even asking to be switched? That's my understanding. They're looking at all um, counties in the state of North Carolina and how that's all going to play out. Commissioner Price? There. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, oh, you'll probably back me up uh, or explain further. Um, the the NC, NCACC will not be making the decision. No. There will be a representative from each of the LME MCOs that will meet. And then they will look at the map and start, you know, divvying up the the state. Yeah, I think that's what Bonnie said. That they're just gathering the information. So right. I was just I was just adding that there's a representative from the Cardinal Board that's been appointed to this our other committee with the other with representatives from the other LME MCOs, and they will be the ones to make the decision. Mr. So, McKee. So what is? I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. What, what happened was when they've created the standard plan, so we're talking about um, physical health, Medicaid, <coughs> and mild to moderate behavioral health, they've created maps of regions for that. And when those maps came out, everybody looked at them and said, oh, well, these don't line up with our current LME, LME MCOs. And LME MCOs are only people that are able to um, apply for those contracts for the first year, so these don't line up very well. So what um, NCACC is trying to do is get input on what those maps should look like, because they have yet to create those maps. So I don't know if that helps or, or hurts. Thank you. Yeah, that that does. Commissioner McKee. Yes. Um, as has been stated, this does not mean that we will be moved or will not be moved, and I expect that we will be informed as to where we're going to be at. But what this would do is send a very strong signal to Cardinal Innovations if we stay with Cardinal Innovations, that we expect for our folks to be taken care of. Commissioner Dorsen. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate the comments from Commissioner Green and Mark Hoplos, and I'm sorry that Commissioner Bedford's not here tonight since she was the one who brought this up. But she is our representative on the board, so I defer to her expertise on this area. As Commissioner Price pointed out, she's also dealt with it on a personal level. and. Um, you know, I think for those reasons, um, it's worth going forward with this, and I'd be prepared to vote on this, support this letter tonight. Um, I think that I, I appreciate that changes are being made, but I think that there's, there's, you know, there's been a lot of problems, and I think that uh, um, I think it's reasonable for us to to reexamine that. So, mm -hmm. so I'd move we support the letter, and I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion on the table to support the letter by Dorson, seconded by McKee. All those in favor, say aye. 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 That's three. All against? Four. Okay, motion fails. Um, so we will not be sending the letter. Yeah, but it failed 3-3, three, three, just to be clear. Oh. Yeah. There's right. only six of us. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So wait, so it, it, it's a tie it, it, vote. It's not a win or a fail. Right. Well, it doesn't pass. It doesn't pass. It doesn't pass. pass. Right. Didn't I should fail. have said fail. I said it doesn't pass. Yeah. yeah. It was Dorison, McKee, and Rich in favor, and Mark Hopkins, Price, Green. Right. 
Okay. Thank you for spending time with us. I appreciate it. Um, reports, we have none. That's seven. So we're going to go to the consent agenda. Does anyone want to pull anything besides what I pulled 8D, approval to propose changes to the affordable housing bond? Okay, if not, I need motion, please, to pass that, except D. Second. Second. Green endorse, and all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Against? Awesome. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm really sorry, my, my voice is going. Um, so, um, in quit smoking. Yeah, no, right? All right, so D, <laughs> building and site design, this is all we're looking at. Um, I read an article um, in the New York Times, I'm sure a lot of you read it this past week, about um, sustainable affordable housing and what, it, what that meant um, that we're, we're building affordable housing before we took climate change into consideration. And a lot of the affordable housing is being built in places that flood. And we, we have that right here. So it no longer becomes affordable if every year and a half either you have to move or you're losing all your belongings. So I asked um, Cheryl to, I asked Greg to ask Cheryl if she can add something about sustainability in there. And if, Cheryl, if you want to come up and just tell us what you added. So this is on um, page two of the handout. And it's number four that Cheryl added. Everything else remains the same. Um, and if, yeah, if you could just briefly tell us what you added, and we can see if we get a, an approval of that. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good evening, commissioners. Uh, if you look at section D on uh, page two, we changed item one and four. And what we tried to do as we uh, researched further on sustainable development, sustainable design, uh, sustainable building, we broke the criteria out. So one, item one really deals with um, the building aspect of that. And so we um, kind of spelled out some of the items. By no means is the list exhaustive. There are other things that fall under there, but we wanted to talk about um, the building aspect particularly just the uh, structure itself. And then item four, still under D, uh, deals more with the site. Understanding that as you talked, uh, as you looked at earlier uh, tonight on the agenda, the changes to permitted uses and the UDO, a lot of stormwater management, floodplains, those things are regulated in our UDO, so that's why we added the language as Orange County regulations will allow. But it, we, we tried to incorporate more and gave a broad opening in that first uh, sentence. The project incorporates sustainable community and environmental design elements in number four, and in item one, sustainable housing design elements. And then we <coughs> spelled out a few just to say what those could include and no other changes. The points, still 20 points in this area, and the total is still 234 based on the previous changes that you all requested uh, when we were here March 19th, I believe. Questions for Cheryl? Sounds good. Comment? This is great to <laughs> add this in here, though, really. Yeah, well, I mean, it, we talked about this really afterwards good. because after the last rain last weekend, I talked to um, Tom Stevens. We had a road that, that got washed out that leads to one of our companies, and Gold Park got washed out again. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Gold Park is in the 100-year in the flood plain, and it's been washed out four times already. So clearly the 100-year uh, flood plain. But we, we can't keep building affordable housing in places that, that is going to be seriously unaffordable. Um, if you lose everything every time it rains. So thank you, Cheryl. Wait, so did we have a four before? We had a, let me look at, let me go back. We had a four. four yeah. yeah. Uh, it only dealt with um, minimally. It did not spell out everything, even though staff thought about that. Um, but we did not spell it out, so we thought it was good to add some clarification. Okay, so, so the, so we, and there was five points in that before also? Yes. Yeah, okay. Commissioner Price. 
and just yeah, to be, and I mean, I'm not objecting to this, but we're changing the points. No, we did not change. We changed the point. Well, according to what's in, this is different from what the agenda packet says. So number one was three, and now it's five. Yes, we did. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I do apologize. We, since we expanded that language. Yeah. Yeah. We expanded the points because we were asking and looking for more things. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, um, so, so I, I'm not trying to be dense or nitpicky or anything, but on number, well, you just mentioned, Penny, you just mentioned not building in a floodplain. Number four, does that actually cover that? The project incorporates sustainable community and environmental design elements, which may include flexible lot design, low impact development, stormwater controls, okay, reduced impervious surface or natural drought resistant landscaping, where in that do we read, don't build it in a floodplain? I think that's the Orange County regulations that we don't Orange County with. regulations. We have to go by Orange County regulations okay. and where they allow. Okay. We do, okay. but then we ask that look at those features here or any other features that would mitigate gotcha. anything okay. of that okay. nature regarding flooding. Thank you. Okay. So would someone like to move? I'll move D? the item, 8D. Second. All right, Dorson and Price, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Thank you all, appreciate that. Okay, Thank you. manager's report. Um, just a reminder, we have um, next week, we have the school joint meeting, and then on Thursday the 25th, that meeting, as um, Donna has sent out, is canceled, the work session. So that's all I have to report. Great. Thank you. Attorney's report? Uh, nothing tonight. Nothing tonight. Okay. So let's move to um, appointments, please. It's um, 11A is the Nursing Home Community Advisory Committee, and um, we're being asked to fill position number three. I'll move Stephanie Miller for position number three. Second. Uh, Green and Markopoulos, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? Okay. And as you know, that has to be a recommended seat. All that. Okay, the planning. I'm sorry, Parks and Recreations, we have um, 2, 5, 6, and 12, and position number 3 has been vacant since 4-30-2018. So let's just take the positions first that we have names for. I'll move John Greeson for position 2, Robert Smith for position 5, Timothy Brady for position 6, and Haywood Rhodes for position 12. Second. Second by Green. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, now we have a position that's Cedar Township, but what? yeah. Uh, We're going to keep holding it open. Okay, and, and, and I will see if I can re recruit somebody from that area. It's been a while. Uh, it's been a long while. It seems like they're really close. Yeah. They're really close. So, uh, I'd like to nominate Jennifer Moore for position three. Okay. There is a nomination for Jennifer Moore. Where is Jennifer Moore from? She's not from Cedar Grove. She's not from Cedar from Grove. And I would ask that we delay it at least one meeting or at least for six weeks to allow somebody to apply for me to talk to some folks in Cedar Grove and see if I can generate some interest up there. Um, okay, so um, Commissioner McKee is asking, are you going to make a motion for that? And then we can I think there's a motion on the floor. Okay. It hasn't been seconded yet. So we need a second for uh, Jennifer Moore. Okay. Then I will make a motion that we delay this appointment for a maximum of six weeks. If after that point we do not have a... Uh, applicant that we open it for it for all consideration second okay um six weeks what what when would that be starting from the night do you want to do a date? three meetings Possibly let's put a date on it first meeting in june first meeting in june okay um seconded by, by mark Hopless. all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. against no okay <clears throat> dorson descends and that's going to come back, and if, you, if there's no one, we're, we're going with it, right? It's open. Okay. Now we 
um, planning board, you have a new green okay. sheet. Okay. Um, Donna, do you want to just do a quick synopsis of what's going on here? You speak loudly. You're good. Come on, yell at us. <coughs> meeting. Uh, Kim Parachi was in uh, position uh, number 10, and that was in at-large, and we didn't have anyone in the Eno Township. She now lives in Eno Township, so y'all moved her over there. It did not transfer over to the membership roster, and when uh, Mr. Freeman was doing the roster, um, it did not transfer over. So what we did, it's correct. Everything's correct on pages one through eight. Uh, the applications were not bothered. And so uh, what we have now is that Kim Parachi is in position number six where she should be. And so position number 10 is now open, which is a net large. And that's pretty much it. And he just changed the, all the, the one through eight to, uh, uh, to reference all that information. Okay. Correct. Everything's correct right now. It's just Kim Parachi was not in the right slot on the membership roster and threw everything off. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the we planning apologize board does for not that make recommendations, correct? They do not make recommendations. Okay. And um, as you can see, there's a segmentation sheet that kind of breaks everything down um, where the applicants live. Right. Which one could be at large, Chapel Hill Township, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks, how do you want to do this? I'd say do it one at a time. I've one got at a time? Yeah. Okay. I, I make a motion for Melissa Poole for position number two for the Little River position. Okay. I need a second on that. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. So Melissa Poole's on that. Then we have eight and ten. Commissioner Price? Uh, Hathaway Pendergrass for eight at large. Second. Hathaway Pendergrass for eight at large. And we have a second by Mark Hopless. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Against? Okay. Commissioner Green, position 10. Um, yeah, position 10. I'd like to make, make a motion for Jessica Aguilar. Jessica Aguilar. Yeah, Ag Aguilar. Okay, for position 10 mm -hmm. at large. Second on that? Yeah. I'll second it. I'm sorry? I'll, I'll second. Second. <laughs> Commissioner McKee, all those in favor say aye. 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 Against? I guess that's unanimous. Okay. Then we have a. I'm sorry, Mark Dorson, Chapel Hill Township. Yeah, I'll nominate Susan Hunter for position 11. Second. Chapel Hill Township. Second by Green. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. aye against. Awesome. Okay. Uh, you all have your information items in the back. And then we have a closed session to discuss matters related to location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by the public body, including agreement and tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered to the public by negotiations, uh, public body in negotiations, NCGS 143-318.11A4, and we need to approve closed session meetings. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved. Second. Okay, seconded by Dorson. McKee, um, first, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.